Thank hey, you. everybody. What's going on? It's Mark and Dave from Tone Talk. Tonight's special guest on episode 33, by the way. We've had 33 episodes, Dave. Can you imagine? Jesus. Yeah. Um, Tom Abraham. Tom, how are you? Uh, Hi, guys. Great. Tom, Tom is a front of house engineer for basically awesome bands that we love, including Alice in Chains uh, and many other bands that we'll get into. So uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, no problem. Fun to talk about rock. We like rock. Yeah, it's still alive, <laughs> despite yeah. what some people no, think. I'll tell you what, man. I've been out all the last two years, and while it may not be on the radio, the shows are packed every night. Yeah, it's almost like uh, rock, rock has turned out of the mainstream eye into the venues, which I'm mm -hmm. fine with because that's good for me. But yeah. I'm on a out on a summertime like mid level hard rock tour right now, and uh, I'm I'm shocked every night when I turn around. And there's fifteen to twenty thousand people every single night. Is it mostly older people like uh, us? It, huge <laughs> age range. No, absolutely. I, I swear to God, fifteen to seventy. Like, oh, yeah? and, and an equal amounts too, like three or three generations easily at these gigs, and I've noticed that too. Well, tell yeah. us, tell, tell us about some bands that you you know you you worked with and stuff. Oh, I'll I'll go in reverse order because it's easy to remember that way. Uh, early on, before I did front of house, I did monitors for Queensrÿche uh, during their like Empire, uh, Promised Land kind of era. And then I went off and did front of house for Suicidal Tendencies and the Infectious Grooves for about three years. And then I was second on Metallica for about four years. And then after that, I, um, I took off and worked for the band Garbage straight for eight years. And also during the Garbage interim, though, I also did Marilyn Manson for about a year and a half. Hmm. Uh, that's when I met you. Yeah, that's right. We met over at Center Staging. When you're yep. doing John's rack. Yeah. Yep. And um did eight years of garbage. And I mean I did a lot of other little stuff within this, but I'm talking about this is the long term stuff. Uh after that, that fizzled out and I did um Angels and Airwaves. I did uh Shakira, uh Allison Chains, Velvet Revolver. Uh what did I do, Dave? We knew each other then. What was I doing? I don't remember. Keith Urban later? Yeah, I did Keith. That's right. I did Keith Urban for four years. Um, kind of got sick of that genre. And then I did Keith up until 2014, from 2010 to 2014. Mm -hmm. And returned back to my the safe whoobie of rock music in 2014. Mm. Um, and I started working for... Uh, in 2016, I started working for Shinedown, who I work for right now. But that's all kind of the real long-term stuff that I've done, you know? Um, it's stuff there's that's been like more than other six shit. months. What's that? There's all sorts of other shit, too. Yeah, there's a lot of other shit. A few gigs and this and that, one-offs and things. And oh, yeah there's, yeah, there's tons of what I call being a fireman, you know? <laughs> just being called in to any fire, right? Yeah, exactly. You just fly down the pole and go do a show, you know? You did that um, last night. I did right. it last night. Yeah, but I ended up doing. But there's some. Sometimes you end up doing really fun stuff when that happens. I remember like uh, one time that happened um, because I had been around a second engineer on Metallica for uh, whatever number of years. Um, when they did the, uh, they played the Black Sabbath uh, induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I got to go mix that. I got to go mix Metallica playing Sabbath tunes at the Waldorf Astoria, which was super fun just to go in there and drop the hammer in that room and uh, then run out the oh, side yeah. door because I knew people were mad. <laughs> but it was fun. You know, you end up with some cool stuff like that, you know, sometimes. That's a great gig. The yeah. Waldorf, you're, the one, you're talking about the one in, the New, in New York, right? In New York, yeah, in the ballroom when you mix up on the balcony there. Yeah, and I actually uh, play, I played that room one night. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, surprisingly, uh, I tried out for a wedding band on drums. In the wedding in that, room, in the in the grand yeah. ballroom, right? And, uh, that was, uh, what was, was really crazy. fun in there was like you know, everyone was like the seated tuxedo kind of thing, and I just when the band started, I'm like, it's Metallica playing Sabbath, you know, you got to drop the hammer, you know. Of course. And they played two <laughs> or three songs, and I could see people trying to look to where front of house was to yell at me, and I had already plotted my escape route. 
and we were staying at the W right outside the door. And I went down the stairs, out the door, up to my room, and locked the door. <laughs> it felt good though. It, it was, was like it. it felt like it felt like a kid again. Like it was very rock and roll rebellious, you know. Fun, good That's stuff. Good. Yeah, you're ripping the faces off of the people in the tuxedos uh, in the front row. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny because because uh, I worked for garbage for so long. Uh, Butch Vig was in the audience, and he was sitting down below me, and. Which is from Wisconsin. He likes a couple cocktails, you know, and he was all ramped up for the Sabbath. And then, so he's looking up at me, like provoking me, like egging me on, <laughs> like, you know, come on, come on. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, I was sober, but uh, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> but given that situation, what else could you do? You know, you got to mix Metallica playing Sabbath tunes like a wedding band. I don't think you're going to do that, you know? It's not your not style. Not even a little bit. Not my style at all. Not your style. Yeah, but those, are, those, are, those are kind of the bands that I worked for for. A lot of years, you know, between a year and up to eight or nine years, you know. So, and how do you? Um, well, I guess uh, take us take us back if you could. How how'd you get into the industry? How how did this all start for you? Uh, how it started was um, I played guitar in a band in high school, like we all did, and uh, I actually went to college. I graduated college, and I was living in Syrac living. I was born in Syracuse, New York. I was working for General Electric in Syracuse, New York, when I got out of college. And, um, but I was also, uh, I had ended up mixed doing sound for the band that I used to be in. I went off to college and they replaced me. And then I ended up doing sound for them. But I don't recall, like, I really knew what I was doing. I was just doing it. And uh, the two years after college, I ended up being the house guy. It, like, what was, like, the rock gig in, in town, like, if a band came through town that was a real band, this is the place they would play. And I was the house engineer there. And, you know, and this was during the time of uh, kind of the New York hardcore scene. Like we did a lot of like Anthrax, Soul, you know, Stormtroopers of Death, Overkill, th that kind of place. And, uh, and we worked a lot though. We did 40 bands a week, you know, and I would get out of work at five. I'd work to two in the morning, go back to work at eight in the morning, but I was a kid so I could do it, you know. And uh, one day, you guys know guitar player Vinnie Moore, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so anyway, Vinny plays a solo show at the club. He didn't have an engineer. Uh, so I mixed the show. His manager, his friends, who is one of the guys that works at Q Prime. And I did, he asked me to do their little Northeastern tour of like 10 days. I took 10 days off from work, went and did his tour. Everything was cool. And the manager said, hey, you did a really good job. I know a guy in New York who, like, uh, deals with crewing for, like, quote, unquote, real bands. And he goes, I'll tell him he did a good job. And I'm, like, already, like, 22 and super jaded. I'm, like, yeah, whatever, dude, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, dude, the next day, the next day, I was on a plane. I was going to do monitors for Dokken on Monsters of Rock in 1988. Get the hell That's out of here. That's what happened. I never went back to work. So I was at Rich Stadium. So your, in Buffalo. your first big gig is Monsters of Rock with Dokken. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That was my first, like, besides the little thing I did with Vinny, that, was, that my first tour was a stadium tour. I just pretend that I knew what I was doing, you know, fake yeah, it. You can make it. That, do you look back on that and shudder to think what you were doing? <laughs> I don't, I, I, I never felt like, I don't know. My memory of it was fairly positive. Like, I didn't feel like I didn't know what I was doing. Right. You know, but at the time, I remember everything back then was simpler, you know, yeah, it analog. was simple. You know, you, you know, it was 14 inputs in a monitor rig. I mean, and I had been doing bands for, you know, the last three years. It's not any different. It's just more stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. and it, it just kind of realized quickly if I if you had a set of ears, you're going to pull this off, you know. Right. And uh, yeah. And then from that, I ended up doing monitors in-ear monitors for Queensryche on the Empire Tour. And that would have been 91, 92. And then I, you know, left the management company. You know, I wasn't really interested in doing monitors, but I did what I had to do to get in there. Mm. Now, see, it, I just brushed over that, that, but that was three and a half years, you know? And uh, wow. they said, well, um, that's how I, they put me out doing front of house for suicidal. And then I've done front of house ever since then. So that's how it happened. I was just in the right place at the right time. Also, I was at a time when this industry, if you had a gold record, you were still playing in an arena. You know? Yeah. yeah so there was yeah. a lot of work. There was a lot of work. You know, yeah, that's, that's not true. so much that way anymore. 
unfortunately. Yeah, now if you have a gold record, you're lucky if you're selling out half the House of Blues, you know? That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just the right place at the right time. But at the same time, you know, I kind of joked about fake it till you make it. You, you do have to kind of have the demeanor and somewhat knowledge to pull it off. You know, right. otherwise you're going to get found out sooner or later, you know? Right. So, right. um, you know, the, all that time we got beat up with the clubs doing all those bands, that was invaluable. And maybe not so much technically invaluable. It was invaluable in learning how to deal with guys and bands, you know? <laughs> Well, that actually, that's a, that's a great segue. There was a question um, Aaron Cram actually asked, is there a polite but effective way to say to the front of house guy that the mix sounds like shit in the venue? <laughs> Had a couple of instances where something needed to be done but wasn't. That's interesting. Like, So when well, you say dealing with, dealing with bands, have you ever had those kind of instances? Well, where with some where I would want to say something to somebody or where the band said something to you like oh you know we my turn my bass up or turn my you know or my drums don't sound right or whatever it is or you know like getting along with the bands and stuff oh no I mean I I don't like with for one of my clients I don't have a problem I mean especially now because of course where I'm at I'm or I'm at now we, we go into pre-production and get all this stuff sorted out you know beforehand yeah. I think you know. he's talking more about just just clubs and so yeah, far. I mean, if, if you're dealing with the clubs and house guys, you just have to, it's no different than anything else. If you want to get your way, you just need to be, you need to suck it up and be polite. You know what I mean? You, you know, if be you come nice up to somebody, them. yeah, if you come up, come up somebody negatively, you're going to get the same thing back times two, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like if you're doing that and you're having to deal with house guys, you need to pick your battles. If you, and you, if you three think there's these three things that are really wrong, pick the one that's really important to you. And say, hey man, introduce yourself, tell them who you are. Could you do me a favor with this? Just be really nice. Could you do this for me? You know what I mean? We'd really appreciate it. That's all you have to do. And nine times out of ten, you, it'll get done. You know? You just need to point it out and you just need to be polite. You know? Yeah. It, it's no different than it's no different than just being a human being in any situation, you know? Yeah, just being or, cool. Yeah. Or bring yeah. your own sound guy. Exactly. You can avoid that by doing that too. You know? And then, you know, a lot of times people don't want to pay for that, but you can also, you know, what's the price tag of, of not worrying about it or having, not having a headache? You can hire a local guy for $100 for a night. You know, if you know he's a decent local guy, you know, yeah. he'll come over and mix you for $100, you know, and that $100 is probably worth the, your stress, you know? That's not that much of a price tag for your peace of mind, really. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, and also, you also have to be a cognizant too, though, that these guys are sitting in this club dealing with this X number of nights a week and making no money. You know what I mean? You got to put yourself in their shoes too. Now, granted, they did take the job. I understand that. But if that's their job and they're there five, six nights a week, listening to loud whatever and making $50 a night, be aware of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like they're sitting there making $500 for the night. It's not, they're not, you know? So, yeah, no, that's good advice. It's good advice. Mm -hmm. um, I actually saw when I was doing some research on you, Tom, I, I found a great video that you had done where you were talking about like new guys coming up in the industry and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, advice for those guys about uh, getting along with the bands and how to last on a tour. Oh, yeah. You know that yeah. that was a really interesting video because yeah it was uh, it, it, it was more about like you know it's a kind of a small little bubble you end up in there and it's you know even though it's not like the military where you have ranks there's ranks you know what i mean and it, it is a little hierar hierarchical is that the right word hierarchical um, your yeah is you that even a your, word? Your position. <laughs> no it is okay. <laughs> hierarchical um yeah. you, rec to say. you recognize your yeah <laughs> you recognize your position on the tour you know what I mean? And act accordingly, you know? And the guys that, the guys that always last, the younger guys that always last are the ones that are just are nice, please and thank you, and smile and pay attention to what's going on and absorb it, you know? People, right. the younger guys that come running in thinking they're gonna change something is where you have problems, you know? Where you got, you know, a 25 year, year old guy at a full sale telling your backline guy who's worked for the band for 22 years, what's wrong with his rack, you know, 
you hear that stuff out of the corner of your ear. You just kind of put your face in your hand and go, oh, boy, here we go. You know? <laughs> just, you're gone. Yeah. 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 Right. But it's, it, once again, that's not, that's not unique to this job. That's, that's like that on any job. Right. No, yeah. it's it's any job. Although it although uh, routinely this day in this day and age, some of that has gotten lost. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so some of that has gotten lost in the younger crowd. Some, <laughs> but yeah. um, well, yeah, go ahead. but but you know, yeah, it's 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 knowing your your place and knowing what to say when and how to say it in a a way where you're going to get the what you right. want done. Yeah, and, very and I've learned that with artists for years. Yeah, and I mean, Dave, you have to deal with it too because you're interfacing directly with some of these people, mm -hmm. you know. And reality, and like one of the uh, what do you want to call it? Um, key things to learn is you know once you assess someone's personality, if say you you have something you really need to get get done, but it's like let me say for example, say I have somebody in a band. And he's just not playing the part right. And I know he's not playing it right. You know what I mean? He's he's behind the beat, whatever. And it's screwing up the way it sounds. And it's my job to make it sound as good as possible. Well, I've done everything I can do. To, now we're at the level where the performance has to be better. Okay? There's only one person that can make that right. It's not me. You know? So you have to approach that in a very delicate way. Because remember, a lot of those people on those stage have very fragile egos. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, very fragile. And you have to do stuff like get him, get the person to think what you're suggesting is their idea. Twist your t comment around in a way that, you're like, even if you make something up, you know, like, hey, remember the day when you told me you were thinking about playing that part this way? That's a great idea. Let's try that. Well, they probably never said that, but they're never going to remember that they didn't say that. You know, <laughs> make make the make the good idea their idea because I don't care if I get credit for it. You know what I mean? Right. I'm just trying as to I, make it right. Yeah, as I call it, this is psychology 101. Oh yeah, exactly, man. It, it, it's that's, it, that's, it's that's, like no, knowing exactly your knowing who you're dealing with. And yeah. How do you get what you want done out of him? How do, right, you, exactly. how do you get him to do it and make him think it's it's his idea or happy or he's right. happy? And if, there's four <laughs> and if there's four different guys in the band, there's probably four different answers to that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You and, know? And, and everyone. So, like I, <laughs> yeah, and like I, like I said earlier um, about working at the club, what did the club teach you? Taught you how to deal with people in bands. You know? That's mm -hmm. what it taught you. And one thing that happens, and this relates to what Mark said earlier, about younger guys coming into the business is unfortunately I, I i came in i mean fortunately for me i came into the business when there was a vibrant and healthy rock club scene there was multiple rock clubs i lived in a city of three hundred thousand people and there was 10 rock clubs that you could work at you know there's no place for younger kids to cut their teeth anymore you know what i mean there really isn't you know it, the scene isn't like it used to be where you were full-on hands-on with these bands five, six nights a week, you know, where is that scene anymore? There isn't one, you know? Right, um, totally. So well, we may complain about the younger kids and how they act when they come in, but where were they ever given the, given the opportunity to learn how to act? So they're having to come out on these large tours where things are a little more serious and a little more intense. And they, they were never trained on the social aspect of how you do this. They may have been trained on the technical part, but you can teach anybody that. You know, it's the other part that's 51% of the job. Unfortunately, there's no vibrant, smaller rock club scene for them to learn that stuff, you know? So I keep that in mind, too, you know? Right, because they're just learning it in school now, right? They go to school yeah. for, for... Yeah, but you can't teach that. There's a problem with this job is uh, the school thing is like kind of, kind of a scam because they've latched onto something they can charge people to learn about there's 50% of this you can't teach. You can't teach somebody how to mix. You know what I mean? It, that's like, that's like I taught Picasso how to paint. You know what I mean? You don't, <laughs> you can't teach it. It's like, you're kind of born with it. You're kind of born with ears or you're not. There's certain musicians who have practiced for this amount of time will be this good. And this guy will practice for two years and be 10 times better than anybody over here. You just, certain people are born with certain skills, innate skills, you know? And, 
musical mixing is not something you can teach if you're going to be a mixer who's going to separate yourself from the crowd. You can't teach it. You can teach the, teach the technical parts of it. You can give advice. But I have one thing I've noticed in trying to teach it for many, many years, that if you're not kind of, I don't know, I want to say born with it. I'm not sure if it's born with it. It's something. If you just don't have it in you, it's impossible to teach it. You just can kind of do it or you can't. Yeah, no, it's the same. It's the same thing with guitar amps. It's, it's yeah. you, you either, technically you can learn technical electronics, but it does not mean you're going to make a good sounding amp. It might work properly, no. but it doesn't mean it's going to sound good. Um, yeah, well, we're both talking about the same thing. It comes down to it's ears. It's the same thing, right? It comes down to ears again, yeah. and, and right. that's yeah. And uh, and uh, you know, it's 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 like I don't think they understand. I don't. Um, sometimes I wonder when I hear certain sound engineers, do they know what this band is sounds like on record? Do they know what this band even sounds like? <laughs> like because because <laughs> you listen to their mix, the front of house mix, and you're like, wow. No. Yeah. Whoa, well, boy. Whoa, well, boy. Not the, the, the thing. The thing. The thing I find shocking is pull yourself down. What you just, yeah, <laughs> pull your, what, you've, what you've just said. They'll think that they nailed it, and you're like, "What?" It's like I don't even know what to do. I just stand back in the corner and go, "Wait, my turn." You know, it's it's weird. You know, I can't personally wrap my head around it, but like, there's some younger guys I've tried to help and stuff, and they have the, the same repeated issues over and over again. And I try to help them out of it a little bit if I can. And I realize that they're not hearing it like I'm hearing it. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. They're not hearing it. But I'm pointing out, they're mystified by it because they're not hearing it. Yeah. Uh, in case uh, you guys don't really understand some of this that are listening or are listening to us tonight, Tom mixes probably one of the best mixers I know of for live mixing for rock mixing. He mix, he makes an exciting mix that you can hear every instrument. Uh, every instrument has its place and it just rips your face off. Hmm. And, uh, and, and that's how it's supposed to be done. Uh, and, and, and it's very, very rarely done play. that way. Very rarely <laughs> done that way. Well, um, my, 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 Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. You know, so 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 you know, it, it, you know, I'll I'll toot his horn instead of him tooting his own horn. Uh, uh, it's 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 unbelievably different uh, to hear, let's say, Alice in Chains mix now versus Alice in Chains when he was mixing it. I'm just saying, <laughs> it's very different. And uh, and when you're mixing, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, like uh, in studio mixing a lot in my life too. Uh, personally, where not a lot of people know that, but um, you mix a mix to be exciting, and there's ways to make it exciting. And Tom does that very well. <laughs> Thanks, how, how, I appreciate it, man. What in what ways would you say you make it exciting? I'm just curious. What well, my POV on mixing any band is, I put myself in the uh, position of being a fan of that band. If I paid X number of dollars for a ticket to see my favorite band, what experience do I want when I walk in the venue? You know, and if I'm going to see, pick a band that I mixed, Marilyn Manson, Velvet Revolver, I want to have my face rocked off. I don't want it to be polite. You know, I want to, I want to have that feeling of I'm clutching the barricade and covered in sweat and the guitars peeling my contacts off my face. That's what. But I yes. want, you know what I mean? Because right. when I was a yes. kid paying for paying to go see a show, see that's a what show. I wanted. That's what I wanted. Right. And I can't yeah. imagine a kid's any different now. And, and so I just mix it like how I want to hear it. And I realized over 30 years of mixing, that apparently is the right answer. Because all of my clients have been very happy with that. Yeah, so, I, I, it's remarkably, remarkably different. different. And I'm just, I just, I just recently experienced this. I guess <laughs> uh, I was just saying I'm not, I'm not going to get into it too deep, but uh, the difference uh, in hearing uh, a band mixed by Tom and then 
hearing it mixed by someone else is alarming. <laughs> alarming. That's a good word. Alarming. <laughs> it's and, alarming. And, and, and it's like all the enjoyment was gone. I mean, yeah, they were up there playing and they played a good, you know, great. And that was fine. But like he said, you want to be that guy in the front, that in, in almost in the mosh pit, you know, with your hand up, you want to punch someone. You know, if especially yeah. if it's aggressive rock music, you want to feel like you want to punch someone, yeah. and uh, yeah. and and that's it's sort of that it makes uh, like that a feeling, fan, man. Yeah, it makes like a fan, and uh, that's what it is. And the thing is, to be able to accomplish that, though, like I'm talking about, you know, face peeling, crushing this, but it, you have to do it without it hurting. You know what right. I mean? And that's the that's the part where it becomes difficult. That's where this skill comes in, and keeping really on your toes with the latest technology that's going to help you accomplish that crushingness without it being painful. Because don't forget, I got to sit out there more than anybody. I hear this show more than anyone in the vortex, in the vortex of the hate, you know? Mm -hmm. So it can't hurt. I would have no career, you know? It would be over. Yeah. So there's a lot of tricks and techniques to use to be able to be like that and be that loud without it hurting. Like what? Um, a lot of it has to do with like, I'll call it uh, dynamic EQ, where at different volume levels, things are EQ'd differently. So you have equalization that follows level. Mm -hmm. So let's say as you're getting louder with certain things, uh, certain frequency bands and those elements are starting to be tucked more than when they were maybe not so loud. Yeah, it's like a multi-band compressor, so, but an EQ. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not like I don't use a lot of static EQ. I use a lot of floating EQ. So let's just take, for example, you got like a crushing rhythm guitar. Like you're feeling the a chugging E note in the in your chest at a hundred feet. You know, which is the desired result. You have to remember to have that tight chugging guitar. You got to have a lot of high harmonics on that to have clarity and definition on it. But you hear that junk on it, so it doesn't sound muffled. But if you're going to have that element in the guitar sound, what happens when you go to turn up the guitar for a solo? It's going to really peel your ears off. So you have to be set up that when you push up that guitar VCA, that you start to automatically mellow out the top end of the guitar. And then when you pull it back, the top end comes back. Right. So you have to set up your, your equipment in your sessions to do things like that. Right. Interesting. So yeah, like yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. What the digital, the digital technology has helped that a lot because it's allowed me to have, to have way more instances, instances of those tools. tools. Like it was, like difficult, it was difficult, in difficult in the past to go up to a sound company and go, I need forty five dynamic EQs. <laughs> like <laughs> you, you, you and what? You five what? Track, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, you were lucky to get two for the vocals, you know? Right. So it's right. been a little easier with software because you can have so many instances of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, I felt it's improved what I do. What's unfortunate, though, is the speaker systems that we now have to mix, mix through, I feel, have devolved since so we've had an improvement in what I'm mixing on, but we have a de evolution of what we're mixing through. So it's like so it's we haven't. Like, it's like we haven't like gone, we anywhere. gone anywhere. We're still treading, We're still treading water. water. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we Tom and I have talked about that before. Uh, it's um, it's with all this technology that we have now and improved supposed improved fidelity and and uh, improved uh, this and that. Um, sure doesn't sound good. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? And perhaps fidelity is, has improved, but rock power has not improved. Right. You know, well, I mean, it's basic physics, man. I mean, look up at a line array, okay? And you got a box that's like what? what? The size of a bathtub, maybe? Not even? Yeah. Not even that big. And you're telling me 18 inch speakers in a box that size are doing what they're supposed to? No, they're not. They're not. They're not doing that. No. You know, it's all done with fake EQ. 
Hey, quick request. And it sounds like that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting a little bit of um, delay for some reason. And people are commenting in the chat. Whereas we're talking about great sound. <laughs> um, Dave, could you um, drop off and come back in and see if maybe that'll work? Let me float sure. out. Okay, hang on. Am I delayed or we're all delayed or what? We're, you're not delayed. So I'm thinking if you could just drop off and come back in. Let's see if that, if that works. Uh, sure. Uh, yes. It worked. Hang on. It worked last time. Hang on one second. Okay. You still have me or not? Uh, I still hear a delay, but Dave, Dave hasn't hung up yet. So. Hang on. Okay. Um, let's see. All right, Dave's gone. Now talk, Tom. I'm here. Okay. I don't I don't hear an echo anymore. Go ahead. And, you hear me? I hear you. Yeah. So um, okay. while we wait for Dave. I, yeah, I stopped off the hotel internet. I just went on to like 4G style. Okay. All right. That, that'll I'm be back. better. Okay. I think we, uh, I think we may have fixed it. Oh, yeah. What uh, was it? I just changed what internet I'm. I, I got off the hotel Wi-Fi and got on like just air Wi-Fi or air internet. You know, what, cellular internet. Right. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure if it was you or, um, or what, but okay. it probably is because this this hotel internet floats in and out of usefulness like a hotel internet does. Yeah, I don't think your your cell phone internet's going to work though. You're yeah, you're, you're, you were better the other way. <laughs> I'll, I'll do whatever. It's switch, just I can't. switch back. Yeah, switch back, to the, switch back to the hotel, if you don't mind. And I'll, I'll say hi to some folks. And uh, So we had Chris, who was hello, hello, first in the chat. How's it going? Cars in depth. Tom Brino. What's up, Tom? Quentin James. Jeff Ripplinger. Uh, Quentin James says he was watching that latest Robert Baker video with the uh, Friedman Cali. Well, that's cool. I haven't even seen it yet. Oh, and he, and he had a BE50 Deluxe. I didn't know he got that, too. Or maybe I did and I forgot. Yeah. Um, uh, Aaron Cram, what's up? Uh, Cyanide Junkie. And Tom, let's hear you. Hey, uh, I'm back, allegedly. <laughs> I think you're all right. So we're, we're good. Um, I don't see Dave. I'm here. I hear you. I don't see you, though. Oh, there you are. There I am. You lurker. You lurker. <laughs> hey, we had a question from Tomulator, Dave. He wants to know uh, what, unless you answered this question. Set it right, to what? eight. His BE50 loop level. Set, set it to it, eight. Set it to eight and leave it. Use your front levels. It's fine. That'll be cool. Unity game. Okay. Real Shred has a question. What was working for Manson like? <laughs> uh, actually, um, I really enjoyed that. It was really, it was really funny to me. Um, I was 100 feet away, so it was really funny to me. Um, uh, but I was very lucky because I got to do it when I was in the band, and uh, he was phenomenal. So mm. my band, it was probably the most metal band I ever mixed in my life. They were tight and they were so intense. It's yeah, really they... fun to mix because no one's ever going to tell you at that show that it's too loud, you know? Yeah. At all, ever. Those no. words are never heard. So it was really fun because I got to be really over the top, you know? And like, it, you, know, you could not be over the top enough. So that was really fun. Um, I, being around that hoot nanny up on stage wasn't super fun, but in front of house, it was a laugh riot, man. And plus, I got along with him great. He he liked me, so there was no problem. So how how often are you actually interacting with the artist um, uh, on a tour? Is, that, not, is, is it every night, or is it just like the beginning of no, the tour? More at the beginning, you know. Generally, just in my personal curve, once I gain their confidence, we I mean we don't really ever talk about anything that has to do with the show anymore. We just talk about whatever, mm. um, unless there's something that needs to be talked about. But once I gain their confidence, generally after a week or two, um, there's really not too much interaction, you know. 
you know, a lot of the bands I've worked for have, are very, you know, and a lot of the other guys I work with are very experienced too. And they understand that and we understand that. So as long as everyone's doing their job, there's really not much that needs to be said, really, unless something needs to be taken care of, you know? Mm-hmm. And how many people so, are and, actually and working on a tour? Interactions like- more, well, interaction is more social than right. technical, really. Yeah. And I'm on sorry, a tour like that, are. no, that's all right. On a tour like that, how many people are like working on something like that on, on all, uh, the, all the gear? On your average mid sized tour, you'll have about three to five crew buses. So that's 25 to 40 people and a band bus or two and then you know every day there's about the same again in stadiums but the touring party will be around you know, 35 to 50 including the drivers hmm. wow i mean like on a, on a huge tour like say like with metallica like our touring party was upwards of 80 or 90 you know wow. but that's that's also got 19 trucks you know and so you know, it's just a once in a month of crap you drag around, really. That's insane. But it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, nowadays, ticket prices, you know, people expect a show now. You can't just go up there with a two sticks of lighting and a four by 12. It doesn't fly anymore, unfortunately. Mm. You know, actually, you know, I did do, I did Rage Against the Machine in 2007 for a few months. And they don't, that's what they did, you know which was kind of great, you know, and we were headlining festivals in, in Europe and they literally went up there with some SVTs and a four, one, four by 12, yep. a backdrop and some side fills yeah. and but made bank, you know, because there was like two trucks, 30 of us, and that was it. Yeah. And it was kind of overstaffed too. Um, but for the most part, nobody does that. There's pyro, there's moving this, moving that. There's, from when I just started doing this, there's like three or four more departments now that never existed back then, you know, like automation and video and whatever and whatever, mm-hmm. you know. You know, and it's, what's odd about it is I still feel the most important thing is, is how the show sounds, but in the hierarchy of the gig, it's gone, it's slipped way down to like fifth place now. You know, so in a way, we're just kind of flying under the radar. You know, <laughs> it's kind of strange. We go, didn't we come here to listen to the music? Well, now they now they just want to holler. Apparently, we're here. Apparently, we're here to watch it. Yes, with our cell phones. Through our cell yeah. phones, yes. Through uh, our, yes. That's another thing. God. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I really appreciate. They do like a beast. I really appreciate ahead, when the Dave. artist uh, when the artist goes no cell phones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, we do like a well, I did it. We did it with Keith Urban too, but with the band I'm doing now, we do like a B stage thing. It's like so the band would come out behind front of house, and there's like a stage set up, and they'll be standing like the the, band, the guy's foot's like right here in front of the kid's face, and they have like a tablet right here. I'm like, what are you? What are right. you watching it on the tablet for? This is so weird, you know. <laughs> like, don't. And I see people like they, you know, you have the video screens up here off stage of the PA. You have people with their tablets filming the video screen. I'm like, what planet are we on? <laughs> Enjoy the show. Remember right. it in your head. Yeah, right. Exactly. Remember it in your head. That's what we used to do, what? right? Will somebody please jump off the stage stage and surf now, please? You know, right. <laughs> be careful. I'll Come knock, on, let's get a quick wall of death here. They do that, and it'll knock the cell phones out of their hands. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so weird, man. It's so strange. It is very strange. Anyway, yes. but yeah, hey, yeah. but um, you know, I actually had a question. I was I was thinking about it. Um, I, I was talking with a friend earlier about it as well. And so, when you're on a tour, like even a festival or an, or a, a, a tour where there's uh, an opening act. Do they have their own sound guy, or are you doing both acts, or how does that typically work? Me, no, I, I just do the band that I work for. But um, most bands will show up with a guy. Uh, say we're like we're now. I'm doing a band that does like amphitheaters and arenas. Um, and say there's two support acts. The middle support act will invariably have like a crew. Sometimes the first support act may not have a guy, 
So the sound company will provide a console and generally the, the SE, the system engineer, will mix the first band. One of the guys that came with the PA system will mix the first band. But most bands do carry a guy. He's usually a double duty guy. He's usually the tour manager or production manager as well. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, we have a question here from Jim O'Brien. Well, you asked Tom how to deal with a too loud drummer that's dominating the soundscape and making it really hard to mix. Oof, that's a problem. It's like a turn lot the of drum, problems turn people the come up, up to the roll. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> turn the guitars up even louder. Um, that's a tough one because these are like for myself. I'm a little lucky now. I, I I work in rooms where a loud drummer isn't a problem. You know what I mean? Because it's not confining. You know, if you're dealing in clubs all the time. You know, that's why the drums are too loud because you're in such a confined space, you know? Um, the only way for him for to deal with that is he has to lay, he has to learn to lay back and understand where he is, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, then you're, then you're getting into his playing style, which gets you back into, boy, you have to make that his idea, you know? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, I used to have a band with a, a very heavy hitting drummer and we we brought up the idea of the um the shield yeah like that plexi shield mm -hmm. he wasn't well, we, into I mean, it we, but yeah i know i mean if that does work to a point but you also have to remember that behind those shields so now made it way louder right okay on his side on the drummer's side if you ever have stood behind the shields when the drummer's doing that it's unbearable back there yeah because you basically put him in a little glass room you know right well i mean we I've did seen... that with butch god i'm sorry we did it with butch big and we we ran that way on garbage for a long time but we only covered the symbols we had ones that were specially made that didn't cover the kit they just covered the symbols oh, and that, that, that was helpful i mean so his face didn't have anything in front of it so he had a bit of a bit of plexi over the symbols here and um it worked you know but we only had a curtain a ride and a hat and a crash you know right, right. so it's not like terry bozio it does work another thing is to it, it, this case for it you got to get a guy who's going to take care of it you know exactly exactly yeah because nothing worse than when it lo looks like crap you know yeah, I've seen Joe Bonamassa has a, he does that to all his amps, too. Yeah. But yeah. it's got to go somewhere. It goes all the way up, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, it goes straight yeah. up. Right. I remember one time, Tom, you said to me, I, you know, I think I, we were talking about stage volume and stuff, and, and you would said simply, whatever makes the artist comfortable on stage, mm -hmm. I will mix. Yeah. But that's... Oh, Tom's say, I have to preface that with preface that with I'm also not on a night to night basis mixed band in a small room. Right. And a large stage in a large space, you know, so if you don't have the engineering skills to get over a loud drummer and a couple four by 12s on an arena sized stage, you need to rethink what you're doing for a living, you know. <laughs> yeah, because on one of these arena stages, I swear to God, you can have an amp crushingly loud, and you barely know it's on. Yeah, yeah. Especially I've been up there on stage, and it just you're like, "Oh, it's that loud." Hmm. Doesn't seem that yeah. way. Yeah, you know. Right. And and, funny uh, to me, like I've say it. Oh, he's cutting in and out. He's lying. You're cutting in and out a lot. The guy with one four by twelve. What's that, Tom? What's that, buddy? You're cutting in and out a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. This hotel internet's. I don't know what to do. You know. Yeah. No, it's all right. No worries. What were you saying? The, it generally comes and goes. Um, like I've seen a guy in like a full size, eighty by sixty festival stage. The guy's got like a fifty, and if one four by twelve, but he's got crank because that's when it's so good. And the guy's like, oh, that guitar's really loud. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's four 12-inch speakers 
on an 80 by 60 stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Come on, man. You can't figure that out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's a bunch of crap. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, he doesn't, he doesn't want to ride the vocal mic that's right in front of it. Because, you know, God, God forbid he mix, you know? Right. Because he, he, you're saying he's afraid of the bleed into the mic and getting all that, you know, and, and so it takes careful touch to do that. Well, the thing is, like, yeah, you have to, you know, if you don't take control of that bleed into the background vocals, it's going to sound terrible. And that can be tough if you don't know the songs. But that's, that's why your job is always easy. You know what I mean? You have to, there's a way to do it. Guy, you look up, and when the guy comes to the background vocal mic, that's probably the time to turn it on, you know? Mm -hmm. And when he walks away from it, it's probably the time to shut it off. You know, uh, I mean, real simple, pretty obvious, really. It is real. Another thing is, too, it's like another thing is like a, like a pet peeve of mine. Like now, even though I play guitar, whatever, um, like people who miss guitar solos live, like you, if you're mixing, you must know something about music, right? Like if the guy's hand went from here to here and the other guy's hand didn't, who do you think is playing the solo, you know? Right. Yeah. Turn them up. You know, <laughs> or not. Don't turn up the rhythm guitar and then leave it turned up, thinking that's the solo. Like, what? What's happening? You know, <laughs> <laughs> stuff I see sometimes is so inane, but it's happening not on a small gig. You know what I mean? It's happening on an enormous gig. Right. And well, if, if it wasn't so sad, it's you know, it's funny. It's sad at the same time, but it's funny too. You know? That reminds me of the Metallica gig with uh, with Lady Gaga. Oh yeah, oh, well, when the sometimes... mic didn't work. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, yeah. We're, she's basically the lead singer for Metallica. Basically, so James yeah. Hetfield is nowhere to be found. Yeah, I heard he was, well, some, uh, someone someone wasn't happy there. Oh, yeah. I heard he was so pissed after that. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, no one did that on purpose. You know, that's yeah, true. But how, it's true. Yeah, but how does that happen? Well, I mean, you know, it, you can only check, you could check it to the point that you check it and it works right beforehand and things happen. You wouldn't believe the shit that I've seen that worked 10 seconds before, you know, mm -hmm. it happens all the time, you know, and it's, this stuff is so technical now, you know, and you need an IT guy in every damn department on stage just to keep things working now, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what, that's the problem, you know what I mean? It's not so tactile anymore. You yeah, know, it's not. It's, it's so not exactly, software-y. Yeah, it's software-y, and it's not. It's not like uh, you know, you're actually having an audio cable running to the mixer. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Interesting. digital snakes and right, all sorts of stuff. That's cool. We've got a uh, question from Big Pappy or Poppy. <laughs> Either way, Hi. cool name. Uh, Tom, tips on how to get the bass guitar tight and clear with a nice bottom end while not being muddy ah, in the mix. I can tell you that. Um, the other thing I sent you, Dave, when I'm going to describe to you verbally is exactly what I'm going to tell him. Um, do this with the bass. Uh, and this is universal. It doesn't have to be like a heavy metal bass sound. It could be any bass. I, I treat all my bass guitars like this, whether it was... Marilyn Manson or whether it was Keith Urban, I'd do the same thing. Uh, you have your bass DI, okay? And that's clean right off the bass, okay? Take a line right off the bass. The only thing it would be uh, post is post wireless or post any very particular effects the guy might have. So we'll call it post pedal board preamp. Take your DI there. That becomes your clean DI. Okay, that's where you're going to get your low end from and only get your low end from that DI. Do not attempt to get your low end from any other source of bass guitar input because you are now going to run into phasing collision and your low end is going to be all over the place. Mm -hmm. Just take the low end off the clean DI. Okay. And you'll be surprised in a PA that at least has some amount of 18s in it and some decent amount of power, how high you need to high pass that bass. Okay. Um, I generally high pass the bass at 90 cycles, which seems high on a bass, but it really isn't in a PA. Okay. And also, don't be afraid to get into the compression on that channel. Remember, this is a clean bass right off the bass guitar 
there is no compression at all, okay? So have your limiter inserted there, three to one, four to one, and be getting into it five to seven dB all of the time, okay? To level it out, all right? Make that your low end, okay? To complete the base picture, take your second line, and I like to use a DI, I don't like to use any microphones. I take a second DI, um, and I like to use a box that's like a radial JDX or a Palmer PDI-09, which is like the little speaker simulator box, like a Hughes and Kettner red box, which is not a good sounding one, but you know what I'm talking about. It's a speaker simulator DI. Um, go up to the bass amp or the bass preamp, whatever is creating the bass tone on stage, and take your second line off there. So basically, it's a DI simulation of, as if you were miking the bass, okay? And then at the console level, I don't know if you're using a digital console or analog, but either way, using a plugin that will generate an amped style distortion, where it's got a tube in it that you can override, or you can actually put a guitar overdrive box on the actual channel insert, and distort that second bass line even more. So basically, the bass guitar sounds like you've plugged it into a Marshall, like a JCM 800, all right? And then high pass that bass guitar really high, around 200 cycles. So the low end of that distorted amp style sound doesn't collide with the low end of the bass DI, okay? Then combine those two sounds together. So you have the DI taking care of the low end, and you have the distorted thing taking care of the mid-range, okay? And then compress that distorted one, just like you did the other bass guitar, and combine those two things together to make the one sound. And th that will work, and you'll get a lot of clarity and a lot of evenness that way. And oh, uh, air on the side of it sounding too distorted, okay? It'll sound like it's too distorted, but once you add drums, vocals, and a guitar, you'll barely hear that it's distorted mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. All you'll notice is you can hear all the notes, okay? And um, it'll gain you all the notiness on the bass without it sound pointy. Because distortion, yeah. remember, is mass compression. And it keeps everything, anything from popping out, yeah. okay? So second bass channel that's distorted, that sounds like a guitar, a bass run into a guitar amp that runs from 200 cycles, low pass at around 2.5 or 3K. You don't need anything above that. And a bass DI that you're only really using about 80 or 90 cycles up to about 200 cycles on. And if you're still having trouble getting definition on the bass, on the bass DI and on the channel, Distorted bass, kick up 1K, about 3 to 6 dB, about a third of an octave wide. And that's bass guitar. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's similar. Awesome. It's, it's, that, that's similar um, when you're making mixes in the studio, too. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same sort of scenario. Um, distorted bass, if it's soloed, you might go, wow, that's really distorted. Yeah, put it in the mix, and all of a sudden you don't hear any of the distortion. Any of it, but yeah. what I'll what do... what it gives you? Same thing with vocals too. If you can, like in the studio, mm -hmm. I know uh, I routinely distort vocals a bit. If you solo the vocal and listening to it, God, it's distorted. You put it in the track. I swear to God, you have no idea there's distortion on the vocal. Yeah, just no I, just, idea. I do the same. I do the same but, thing to the snare the snare drum too. But what that adds, and this is where the exciting mix comes mm. in. What it adds is excitement to the audio. It adds excitement to the mix. Even acoustic guitars you can distort. It's really yeah. interesting. And again, in the mix, you don't hear it. But mm -hmm. it adds like this excitement to everything and this, uh, you know, that. Yeah, it's the, like, it's distorted, but it reads as clean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you perceive it as clean, you perceive it as notes. If you like you said, when you solo it, you go, My God, that's really distorted. But in the mix, it's not distorted, it still reads as clean. But that's how you get note definition. Because that distortion is creating such mass compression, you're creating a real flat line. Okay. And mixes are so dense, they're very competitive. You know, you have a tiny little window for that thing to fit without it becoming dis disparate to everything else, becoming mm. too loud. And if you start to drop it down a little bit, it's gonna disappear. You know, and that distortion allowing to have it have a place to live. But you can overdo it too, though, right? 
Uh, oh yeah, you can overdo it, but I mean that—that's where engineering engineering skill comes in, predicting the amount of distortion you might need to get away with this. You know what I mean? The second you lose your attack note definition on the distorted side, you've gone too far with it. Okay. Once the distortion sounds muddy or flubby or flappy, you know what I mean? Where you, the attack of the note is gone, you've done it too much. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Um. We've got a question here from Thrifty Flipside. Does Tom have a preference indoor or outdoor venue, or does it make no difference? Um, I, my favorite things to do are uh, big fields outdoors because there's no room competition in those gigs. Um, you're not there's no reflections. You know, just a flat field outdoors always sounds the best. Um, but at the same time, I almost do consistently like the sound. <coughs> of a mid-size arena. You know, like the, you know, like the crappier hockey rink in your town where the AHL team plays? It's like four to 6,000 people. I love those size rooms for rock shows because they, they're the right size rooms to have a big show, but they're not so big that people are detached from what's going on on stage. Mm -hmm. And those gigs have a kind of an energy and intensity to me that I like. Also, with audio, you can completely drop the hammer on 5,000 people and they can't get away from it. In an 18,000 NHL size rink, you can be at the back of the room and it's just not going to be that crushing. You know what I mean? Mm. You'd be able to hear it fine, but you're not in it to win it back there. In a smaller arena, if you've come onto the arena, you're going to, you know, you're there to get into it, you know? So I think I like those size rooms for... What about uh, theaters? Uh, not a fan of theaters. No. Not at all. No, it's, theaters aren't designed to do what we do you know there's no room there's no room to put the gear there's no proper mix position um you end up mixing under the balcony against the back wall you can't hear anything but low end uh they might be pretty and people always seem to think theaters sound good they don't sound good at all they're, they're terrible sounding for the technology we use we use line arrays which are our wide dispersion but they hang against the wall so 50 percent of the pa you're using is blowing right into the wall that's creating a massive reflection and you can't turn that off, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't like theaters. I mean, the size of it may be nice for a show, but, um, uh, for, for audio, I, I don't like them at all. I like big outdoor shows and f like a flat field show and midsize arenas are nice. Do you remember mixing Alice? One of, one of the first times I saw him, uh, at, uh, in Detroit, I came to Detroit. And you mix, you mix them in St. Andrews. Oh, man, yeah. Well, that's, With the that, box that's, PA. That's, um, those kind of games are like, that's like you've gone back and taken like an, a boxing class. You know what I mean? Where it's like you against the venue. You know what I mean? You're going to try to bring each other down, you know? But it was crushing. So I crushing. Know, I know the band hated it, but it sounded yeah. fucking great in that room. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's fun because you can... You can bring it because you have to bring it. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're in St. Andrews in Detroit. It's dirty. It's nasty. You know, and there's a heavy rock show in there. When you walk in in those doors, you want someone to be delivering the goods in there. You oh, know? yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. Hotter than hell. I remember. Uh, oh, the, dude. The, so the, 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 the VIP area was upstairs. And... Uh, so you walk in from outside, which is it was relatively cool. You'd walk in, okay, yeah, yeah. it's a little warm. Uh, and then you walked up to the top of the stairs, and all of a sudden you went. <gasps> it's like, it's, it was the top of the stairs was like a whole other weather system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And said at this time, I think that was two thousand eight, maybe. Yeah, nine. It was. A, it, was um, it would have been eight. Yeah, it would have been 2008, the beginning of Black Gives Way to Blue, rec the tour, I think. Yeah, um, it was after I finished Velver, and we did the rehearsals for Black Gives Way to Blue. Yeah, and uh, and at that point in time, they still allowed smoking in the places in Detroit. Yeah. And so not only did you walk upstairs to a uh, 100-degree temperature, uh, Everyone up there is fucking cloud. pounding cowboy killers. <laughs> <laughs> but again, still, the show was killer. I know the band yeah. said they had a horrible night that night, but you wouldn't know it. They they were pros. So yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, they're totally yeah, so pros, man. You would never have known. I was like, this fucking rocket. And of course, Detroit, <laughs> Detroit concert goers in general. Yeah. Want you to rip their faces off and they want oh, to yeah, rock. For sure. And they're no, going to get sure. drunk and rowdy and they're going to, the crowd is going to be into it. It's like the quintessential uh, rock crowd. In yeah. America. Yeah. Like we actually, we started the tour, uh, well, not the tour, but the leg that I'm on right now at DTE in Detroit. You know? Oh, yeah. And, and it was packed, dude. There was 18 and a half thousand people there. Like you can't have any more people in there. And uh, fucking crowd threw down, man. Like threw yeah. down hard. I thought the band. I thought the show was kind of awful, but nobody seemed to care or notice. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Now, do you measure uh, dBs on how loud everything's getting? I don't particularly measure it. I mean, I know what it is. You know, I I'm very good at spotting it. You can I mean, I can it. look over. I can look over and go and read it off the screen, but I can also tell you what it is just by my like based on experience. I guess I'll say. So right. what is it? So what is it? Uh, A or C weighted. Oh God, I don't even know how to answer that one. <laughs> uh, A, A weighted with or with A weighted without the vocals or with the vocals? <laughs> you don't have to get well, very specific. I, I, I'd say, I mean, A weighted, it's probably 104. Uh, C weight or A weighted with the vocals is probably 107. C weighted, it's probably 112 to 115. Got okay. it. So loud. Yeah, yeah. that's loud. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um here we got a question for you. By the way, uh, when we were talking about uh DI boxes, someone wrote bro wrote uh no radial or palmer. We need the Freeman Mike no mo. Woody yeah. Garcia. Yeah, I've been wait I've been waiting on that for about three years too, Dave. Uh you're gonna see those any second now. Honestly. And, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, honestly, I, in fact, I have I, to I, check on that. Dave, I stopped holding my breath in 2015. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You were, yeah, you wouldn't be here with us. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually done, and honestly, everyone who's paying attention, um, that's the thing out of the back of the runt, right, Dave? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I've heard that when it was just the little PC board, and that by far, I mean, I live on Palmer's, and I lived on J JDX's to this day. That's all I use, and um, uh, that... The Friedman one is by far the best sounding one I've ever heard. Like not by a little bit. It kills the other ones. It mm. sounds like you're standing in front of a cabinet. It really does. So I can't wait to use them. I have one sitting next to me. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that helps me. I'm gonna have to collect. The, I'm, gonna ha I'm gonna have to collect the prototypes and send them to you, Tom. I'll even buy them. Uh, They're so no. cost effective. <laughs> they replace all those stupid microphones you don't need yep that's true yep um andy pesia has a question um he says i use a torpedo cab di to front of house fed with my line out from my be 100 mm -hmm. okay. what are the best frequency ranges i should feed front of house for a good starting point baseline Frequency ranges. I'm not exactly how sure how to interpret that question. What, what, wait for a bass or no B100? He said right. B100. Fucking guitar, yeah. Well, you got it's just an I. Those are it's a, that's an IR loader. So you're just feeding them. Uh, uh, he's he's going to get the frequency response of whatever impulse he's yeah, loaded. Just I would just put it on the one you like and that you think sounds right and give it to the front of house. I mean, they they should probably just high pass it a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to high pass it and probably take a tiny bit of high mid off of it and be done. Yeah, another thing is too, I noticed in his question that he said that he was taking it off of the uh, uh, the line the line out of the B one hundred. If you can right. on that particular unit, you want to take it off the speaker out. Um, well, that is the line out. The line out is off the speaker, uh, so uh, it, it it it's just a pad. It's off the speaker and the and uh, so it's not an issue. It's the same as the pads in the in the cab thing. Does it get the same feedback as from the speaker? Same thing. That the, oh, it does. Okay. Yeah, it's a line out directly off the speaker jack, so it's just like the pad that's already in the in the. Uh, oh yeah, like, like I always like don't thing. take Palmer's or JDX's off preamps out. I take it off speaker outs. Yeah, you know? it is the line out is a, off the speaker out. So. Oh okay. 
I retract my statement. It's just basically like a variable pad that you can just control the level and do. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. Yep. No, so it, that, it, that's fine. What he's what he's going to send in front of house is going to be what the the impulse response that that, that he's loaded dictates. Yeah. It's not a cha it's not a changeable thing on the unit. What you're sending is what you've loaded. Oh, you know? and if you're talking about uh, and here's another thing on that on that box, if you're if you have turn off all your power amp simulation and turn off any EQ on the box. Don't 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 touch don't use any of that stuff. Yeah. Just just a great uh, put your favorite uh, you know IR in there. There's some really good ones now. Yeah. Um, that and that's are done all you need by to do. Vari various uh, companies um, or even there's a few decent ones from them and yeah, uh, I mean, all, all front of house needs to do is probably high pass that at about 150-ish in a PA and mm -hmm. maybe take a little bit of 3K out of it and you're probably fine. Hey, Dave, then, what's... Oh, sorry, Tom. God. And then turn it up louder than God. <laughs> Yeah, don't 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 have these and and yeah, and don't have these mixes that I keep hearing when I go to a show where it's like it's a guitar band. Right. But why is the guitar but, band? Why why is the why second, is the bass, second why is the bass the and the drums drum. so loud? <laughs> right. Right. It's you a guitar both. band and the guitar should be on top. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you ever listen to their ever listen to their record? Huh, weird, huh? Yeah, listen to their record and see how that sounds, and then hey, there you go. Yeah. Well, but you yeah, know what part was, of the issue is. Go ahead, Dave. You know what I was noticing too, though. It, there's some stuff about. Um, so, like for instance, Alice. When you were mixing Alice, I would notice that you would. It would seem like there'd be a lot of ambient on the drums, like a lot of. Uh, I don't know if you added reverb. I don't know what you did. Added reverb to the drums, so the drums sat back. Uh, mm -hmm. And the guitars were drier and more in your face up front, except when mm. there needed to be delays on it and yeah. stuff, which you added. Um, and and then the bass kind of sat even with the guitars, just kind of glue. like one frequency nice. spectrum. Yeah, like, like the glue. Like, like glue. Yeah. yeah. So the bass and the guitars are the same. It's just the different taking up different frequencies. Yeah. And and uh, and then the vocals were a little above, you know, just a little above the guitars. So you could hear them, and there was also nice ambient reverbs and delays and things on the vocals, where it gave it. Not only did the mix sound wide and huge, it also sounded deep. So with the yeah. drums kind of being a little more ambient and very, um, very much uh, a lot of attack on them. Yeah. Uh, you had a lot of attack on the kick, so nothing fought each other. So the drums weren't in the where the bass frequencies were. Uh, right. They were they were very cutting. Uh, kick drum would just you know punch you in the chest, really really good. And then mm -hmm. uh, you know nothing fought each other, so you would hear every single instrument as it should be, clear as day. Yeah, that I remember the drum and the, the drum and bass thing forward and backwards accomplished with parallel compression on the groups. And there was a ton of reverb on the drums, but the reverb was very, very loud, but very, very short. Uh -huh. and, like almost uh, like a slapback. So, yeah, so the drums and bass always sat in the exact, their quote-unquote designated spot, because on that parallel compression, if Sean or Mike ever laid back, they got turned up. And when they laid in, they got turned back down. So I never had to touch the drums or bass. They by virtue of parallel compression, they always sat where they were supposed to. Because I was too busy with the guitar and vocal to do that anyway. Mm. You know? And the, yeah, right, and the guitar sits very dry right in your face. Mm. So which, what you which, heard was was, was the intent. Yeah, which 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 I know, I know that was the intent. Uh, I, I was just making a comment on it because when analyzing it and just listening back to it, it's like, oh yeah, I totally understand this. Mm. Um but also the you know like the DI sound of the guitars, seemingly in in if you just heard the board tape would seem pretty dry, right. and up front. But you got to remember that this is in a big arena. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're, so if you're, you're standing you're, in the arena, you're, you're not here in that You're already standing thing. in five seconds of reverb. You don't. You don't need. Yeah. You don't need any any extra ambient because you have you have the ambient. That's why the DIs work really well live. Yeah. Uh, because they make the guitars cut, and yeah. they and, and 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 then you have the the room from the room itself. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I never understood what you heard people on guitar and vocals that put like a three second reverb on it and you're inside a hockey rink. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Standing in three to five seconds of reverb, you know? Right. That's <laughs> natural, natural reverb right there. Yeah. I mean, I, I use the reverbs that are very bright and very short just to get drums to come out a little bit more. You yeah. know, um, I don't use reverb on anything else. Every, all the other effects you heard was pitch change on the vocal to give that spooky Alice in Chains vocal sound. Mm-hmm. And, um, and delay on the guitar and the vocals, you know, which I would just tap per song, you know. Yeah. Have Have you um Have you worked on any live albums? Anything that's been put out? Uh, not in a very very long time. The only the last live record I have any credit for was uh, the Queen Drake Operation Live Crime, <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Oh, uh, yeah, that Infectious Grooves record too. I that was actually from my console. That record. But not anything, not anything that's a big deal or anything. That Infectious Groove record, is that, you're talking about an old one? It's live in Lyon in 1995. Okay, maybe I don't have that one. I do have it's, uh, I, I personally bought it off Amazon. I don't know if it's still there. Hmm. That's cool. Um, there was a question back. Let me see if I had it. Otherwise, I'll just ask it. Um, no, I guess I don't have it. Uh, highlighted anymore so the question was um how do you deal with artists or bands that are piping in stuff from their album as part of the tracks tracks. oh god Eh, don't get me started um this is the monkey on my back this unfortunately bands think they can't play anymore without tracks which is a crying shame because if they just buckled down and got a little bit better, they could completely play without tracks. Let's take Velvet Revolver and Alice in Chains, for example. Two great bands that people would come up at the end of the show and almost accuse me of them using tracks because they sounded too good. But those are the two bands that didn't use tracks because they were good, you know? Uh, and that's the truth. Uh, tracks are a very difficult thing. Uh, if it's going to work, it takes a lot of time. And if you're not going to put the time in, you might as well not use them. You need, you cannot take your tracks from the studio and play them through a PA system. It doesn't work that way. It's horrendous sounding. They are way too hyped in the high end, the high mid, the low end. It doesn't work. Mm. Okay. You have to stop per song, per track, and figure out with the mix you already have, with a heavy kick drum, a heavy bass, a loud guitar, and a vocal, where these tracks are going to fit in with that, okay? Um, You have to make that determination per song, per verse, all right, in advance. And then you have to sit there and EQ and high pass and compress and low pass those tracks to get them to fit in to what I talked about before. You That is going to materially take... Five, you'll get five songs a week done if that's all you're doing. And for you to accomplish that, you have to listen to, you have to have already completed your mix of the band, okay? Then you have to go and play the tracks back through the same system you're going to be using or equivalent. You can't play the tracks back through studio monitors. You have to play them back through monitoring, quote unquote, something that acts like a PA because that's what you're going to be playing it through, something with horns and 18s and all that stuff, Mm -hmm. and EQ the tracks around that, okay? That's the only way you can get them to fit. Otherwise, it's going to be, you're going to be chasing that all night. You will not be mixing anything, and it will still sound terrible. Hmm. And that's what you have to do to make tracks right. It's a huge commitment, okay? And uh, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work, man. And a lot of people don't. Do that commitment? No, they don't. Nobody Which is does. Why it all sounds like crap? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I blatantly like, I refuse. Like, if they're they're not going to take the time to do it, I, I say I'm sorry, but I can't help you. Mm. You know, because I'm not going to set myself up to fail, and that's right. what that is. Okay, and that's the truth of that. You know, 
Now, I'm not talking about a siren sound effect that happens once in a song somewhere. I'm talking about every song has got percussion tracks, a layer of guitars, a layer of keys, fake backups. The lead vocal sings here, but it doesn't sing here per song. And I'm talking about 10 tracks running per song, that level of density. That's what you have to do to those um, to get it to work. You know? How often is that happening? Every damn day. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 the only two, put it this way, in the last, since the mid 90s, I think there's only, I've, the only, at the top of my head, the only three bands that I've ever done that I haven't had to deal with that was Alice in Chains, Velvet Revolver, and Rage Against the Machine. Hmm. Every other band was Track Fest. So Metallica, Track Fest. No, I wasn't mixing Metallica, and that was before the mid 90s. Oh, okay. I was gotcha. second on Metallica. I was a system engineer. Um, I see. I said from 90, 98 onwards. Um, gotcha. My Metallica stuff after 1998 was like just one offs, like at the award show kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of that. And it's, that's, you know, what's, what sucks about it is it sucks the life out of a show, man. The second you force a band down to a click track, it just, it sucks. You know what I mean? I can tell the difference now. You know what I mean? I've seen, even when the band I do now, you know, like I've seen the, I've seen the click track fail and the band just kind of do their own thing. And I'll go back and, and go, my God, that was awesome. You know what I mean? Like they came to life. Right. Like ugh, you can play with each other. You guys can play. You know what I mean? Like go ahead and play. You know, it's weird to me. It's almost like the band needs to hear it more than the crowd ever cares, you know? Right. It's, it's a strange thing, and it's really prevalent nowadays, and it's really unfortunate because I, I, I get to work with, like, even Keith Urban, man. Like, that band was incredible. That's like a who's who of Nashville players, mm. you know? And it was like the tracks were the most important thing. I'm like, you see who's playing drums? Do you see who your guitar players are? What, why, why, what do we even have these things for, you know? It's so silly, but I don't know. People just have this in their head now, you know. Now I granted, I understand that a lot of stuff in the show is driven off time code now, so the drummer has to play to a click. But mm. it doesn't mean you have to have audio pushing out. You know what I mean? Right. You can he can play to a click that generates time code for pyro. That's fine, you know. And I get it. There's a lot of big visual stuff that might have to come off that, but that doesn't mean you have to have tracks running with the guys who can play. Now, I'm lucky all the bands I work for, everyone in these bands are really good. They're really talented and they can play. It's just, a sh I get bummed out when their playing is hampered by the fact that you're playing along to a, a CD, basically. Right. You know, well, I, I don't get it. But I mean, are, aren't there some cases, and I'm, I'm just speaking about maybe guys like, you know, McCartney or who are doing things that were done in the studio that can't possibly or are very hard to redo live. But, yeah. but, but, but but you're talking about isolated things within a right. song. Right. I'm talking about full track density for an hour and a half. That's insane. In in every song, you know. I'm not even sure that McCartney is using a lot of tracks, or if any. Really? Yeah. Man. I mean, mo mo he most is people. A great band! Oh my god. Yeah. Well, oh most yeah, people that's that, amazing. That are more experienced uh, and aren't so what do you want to call it driven by visuals. Uh, will understand no matter how you play the song the crowd likes, no matter how you arrange it or instrumentate it, they're going to still love the song. So if you have something in this, you can't do off record, it's impossible to replicate, it, put on an acoustic guitar and sing an acapella. They're still going to cheer. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, you know, and whatever little thing you thought on the record was the biggest thing in the world, if it's a good song, you can strip it any way and slice it any way, and it's still a good song. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's true. It's interesting. I, I forget who said it back in the chat, but um, they were saying that it, I'd rather not have all the big fluff with all these shows and have cheaper prices. Yeah. For, you know, um, yeah. I kind of agree with that. Um, but then again, you can, I, I don't know why it popped in my head. It's not like I listen to this guy at all, but uh, Ed Sheeran. Yeah, I know who he is. Right. This guy gets out there with just an acoustic guitar. Yeah. And he has no overhead. 
<laughs> yeah. I always thought that like a band like Metallica to do like a garage days tour where they, the drums go on a carpet and the guys play through two four by twelves and there's two sticks of tr stick trusses and it's a $30 ticket mm -hmm. and they would That'd still make great. more money. <laughs> it would be killer. You know, it'd be killer. You know what I mean? And, and nothing else. Literally they'd have like two trucks. You know what I mean? Right. It'd be killer and they could still make a ton of money and every show would be sold out with a $30 ticket, you know? And the crowd would probably be even more intense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just people have gotten... The visual things is such a crutch to artists nowadays, which is really unfortunate that that's become the status quo, you know? I mean, you that's expect become that from, the most important thing. You, know? you expect that from pop music, you know? But exactly. Not but not. It's, reached, it's, it's reached over, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not to everybody. You know, not to everybody, but you know, what are you going to do? That's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> it's the, it's the industry, unfortunately. Um, let's see if we ha what other questions we have. Um, oh, um, Dave, I had a question for you on the runt. So, and also on the Mike no mo, right? So that has an IR built into it, right? No, the, no, those are those are uh, those are analog just the cab simulations. Oh, I see. Okay, done with, actually, in our stuff, it's not done with ICs or anything. It's actually done with uh, audio transformers. No, oh, right. Gotcha. Indu inductors and that's why it's not active; it's passive. Yeah, Palmer, Palmer's it's like so it, it, too, but it's just a different curve. Yeah. What was it based on? Wasn't that wasn't that wasn't that, box, wasn't that box Bruce's idea? Origin, uh, originally, yeah. yes. The circuit came originally uh, from Bruce Agnator uh, that he had developed, and then we we kind of tweaked it beyond that. Hmm. Yeah, that 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 little Friedman box is incredible sounding, man. Remember the day we ran it through those little Yamahas you have there? Yeah. God yep. damn! I was like, I didn't think it was real. I thought you were playing a record or something. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, it's killer, man. Hmm. I'm gonna get those. I'm gonna get those to, uh, like, like with a small box. Uh, I'm gonna get those to track off of that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. The, those, they, you know, the the mic no more. They, they're just like the Palmer. They're just a pass through to the speaker cabinet, right? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing. Right. Same idea. It's no. the box. Remember, remember when I had that prototype in Jerry's rig? Yeah, is it, it's is, different. Is the box that. is it smaller now? Yes, it's. Yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold it up. So, it's right here. Oh, okay, right. So uh, it's kind of a uh, you know box. It's the size of a DI box. Size of a DI box, like a maybe a right. radial DI box or something. So speaker in, speaker out, and line in. Speaker in, speaker out, no line in. Uh, level on the front, ground lift, and two different voices. Is there um, is there a pad? Is there padding on it? Yes. It's three. Yeah. Is it like two, zero? Two way. two way. Two way pad. Yep. So you pad it down uh, like a fifty or a hundred watt head, and smaller head you, you don't. Uh, yeah. You it just depends on what uh, kind of polymer style. Yeah, it just depends yeah. on what uh, you'll know if it's distorting. Right. <laughs> oh, you'll hear it. Yeah. You'll hear it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. And Adam Stewart had a question. When someone like Butch Vig is in the band, does it make the sound engineer's life easier or harder? Um, actually, people, I've been asked that question quite a lot because everybody in that band, I mean, Butch was obviously the most like famous guy. But everyone in that band, besides Cheryl, it was a producer, engineer kind of person. Uh, more producers. Everyone, every guy in that band produced bands. And uh, so that's a very obvious kind of question. But it was funny. Uh, they were more hands-off than anybody I've ever worked with. Um, they were very happy to not have to deal with it. Right. And they also said, we don't know anything about live sound. That's why you're here. Let's go have cocktails. That's what that's was their mentality. So they just they never they never said they literally never said a word. They just let me do it the way I wanted to do it. 
That's great. I don't ever them. I don't recall them ever saying anything to me, even at the beginning. You know what I mean? I granted. I mean, they would come back in when I was doing playback and obviously hear what I was doing before we went on tour. They never said anything then, but they must have obviously been happy with it. So because literally in the eight years, I think I was there. Um, they never said a word, not once. That's great. Except for we're happy to have you deal with it, so we don't have to. Right. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like a vacation for him, right? Let's just play music. Oh yeah, totally. Because that's that's the only reason they ever did that band is so they could get up on stage and play rock star and have fun. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The second they had to stop doing that, they would find touring kind of annoying. You know. Right. Um, Stephen Matucci has a question. Mm-hmm. Any tips on getting guitar sound and feel right with IEMs? <laughs> oh, inner monitor. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely a, the biggest trick. I mean, granted, I haven't done in-ears in years, but nothing's really changed with that because, I mean, obviously I work with a guy to this day every day of my life who's doing in-ears on the other end of the snake. And um, in my personal experience, the day that I stopped having trouble with guitar players and in-ears was this day the day that a i took the guitars direct okay and was using a palmer a uh, uh what radial jdx or like the mike no more like we've been talking about okay which took any phasiness weirdness out of the guitar lines because if you really listen to a guitar mic input especially on a club stage there's the snare drum, there's the hi-hat, there's whoosh, whoosh of whatever, and the mic's moved an eighth of an inch, so the guitar sounds now completely out the window. The DI makes all that go away, okay? And it also makes it gateable, too, so you can soft-gate it so it's dead quiet when you're not playing. It's soft-gated at the console, okay? You, once you get your guitar sound with that input, you know, and it's not really that different. You'll have to high pass it a little bit lower than front of house. You probably high pass it around a hundred. All right. And then just get rid of any hardness that you hear in that and just find it. It's and in in ears, it's gonna be about one and a half K and then again double that around three K. Okay. Just keep it a little tempered there. And then take your one line there, pan it to one side hard so it's say it, it's in your left ear, okay. Take that ex- very same line, copy it to another input, and pan it to the other side. But on the side you pan it, so now you have the same thing panned hard, okay? But on the second line, delay it 15 milliseconds, and then turn that side up 2 dB. Your guitar sound will be fucking enormous mm. in the ears, and the guitar player will never talk to you again. Trust me. <laughs> the second I did that to the Mike Wilton and Chris DeGarmo, I don't think I ever spoke to them ever again. They were okay, so we, thrilled. That, we love you. that simple little thing. I mean, that's what I do at front of house. The guitar sound you heard on the thing I sent you, Dave, that's what that was. That's one Palmer panned hard and the same thing panned the other side, delayed yeah. 15 milliseconds. Right. The only thing you have to remember, though, is when you delay something and it's the same thing and it's panned hard, your ears will perceive the late one as being quieter okay so you have to turn up the delayed one about 2 db okay it'll sound off otherwise it'll sound Mm -hmm. quiet even though it's not so your metering don't your metering for the two ears it's gonna it's it's gonna look a little bit off okay because you've had to turn up the delayed one but you you need to do it because you're that's the way your ears work Um, but that'll create an absolutely massive guitar sound in the ears and your guitar player will be thrilled very cool. I've got, I've got two questions for you. Um, one, if you could talk about um, the trend. Actually, it kind of goes hand in hand, but the trend of not having um, amps on stage or so things underneath the stage or having ISO cabs or these types of things, mm-hmm. um, or even uh, where they're going to just modeling with Kempers and stuff like that. Right. So can you, if you could just talk about you know, your dealings with those types of things, ISO cabs and, um, and the modeling. Where I'll, I'll go quickly to the point where it doesn't work. It doesn't work if you have a full-blown conventional monitor system, a full-blown raging backline and in-ears. You can't have all three. 
that's a mess of mistiming, okay? Because you're hearing this before you're hearing that before you're hearing that. And it's mm. the same thing three times, not even counting what's coming off the house, okay? That's just a nightmare, okay? The most important thing to do is get the band on the same page. Pick how you're going to listen to yourselves. Are you going to listen to yourself over conventional monitors? Okay, then we're not going to use ears, okay? You got to get everybody on the same page and how you're going to do your monitoring, okay? Mm. Then... If you're going to have some guys that are four guys that are hell bent on conventional, but the singer's hell bent on ears, then you got to make sure there's a spot on the stage that the singer can go that's can quote unquote his happy place. Okay, that there's not really any competition there. Okay, he's got a place downstage center that there's not really a whole lot going on. Okay, now, I, and I understand this too because I like to play and stuff too. You don't need to have. X number of 412s up there behind you, you really only need one or two, okay? And if you have, even let's say you have two 412s per guy, just keep them on the floor, down low, where you feel it down low in the bottom part of your body, okay? And then put your ears in, and that's not gonna bother anybody who's mixing or doing ears or anything, because it's down here, it's down low, it's three feet below the microphone, okay? Now, you can't double stack the cabinets, because that's going to be a problem with a vocal mic. Mm. But if you have four 12s down low on the ground, that's not going to bother anybody, okay? And even if that, those four 12s are being uh, sent up to two wedges in front of the guy, that's the guitar player's alley. That's his little spot, okay? But you got to keep it contained to his spot, you know, coincidentally on stage right or the other side of the stage. Um, and there's also remember, no... not to interrupt you on that, but... Uh, do you remember John Five when you were doing him? Oh yeah, dude. His like, little world, his yeah. little world of hell, right there. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Two but monitors he was blaring back at him in two yeah. stacks, blaring. Yeah, no, he, his his side fill was a full on like club PA. Uh, he 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 was doing that to piss off Manson though more than anything. He was just doing that <laughs> to make he was doing that to make Keep Brian Manson mad. Out of his area. Yeah, exactly. Because I I couldn't even go up there like if I went up to do roadie line check. To play guitar for the monitor guy, I couldn't stand there. Like when I did Motley Crue, it's the same thing. Mick Mars is the same way. I can't stand in front of the guitar rig with the monitors on. Like it shuts my head off. It's like it's so loud that your ears shut down. Um, yeah. Which is why those people can't hear. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but yeah, getting back to the to Sorry. the actual question. Um, there's no problem with having a couple four twelves on the stage, even at you know, even with them moving some air. I'm not saying AC/DC volume, but like good nominal volume where you feel them, as long as they're down low, okay. And if that guitar player doesn't want to wear ears at all and he wants two wedges opposite the four by twelves, that's fine. As long as you keep everything tonally pleasant, it's not high midi and screeching and horrible sounding, you know keep it fat and warm and keep him in his little power alley there. Each guy has his little spot. You know what I mean? That way they could pick and choose if they want wedges or if they want ears. Okay. The other thing is too, with like, say for example, the ISO cabinet thing, conceptually the ISO cabinet thing is not a bad idea. It's just functionally, it's a terrible idea uh, because unless you're just using the cabinet that's in the, the box, the ISO box, as a load um, to take a DI off of it, that's fine. But miking inside of an ISO box is horrible sounding. Sounds like shit. It's terrible because there's so much air pressure on the speakers. And remember, a microphone diaphragm is a really tiny little sensitive speaker, okay? If you're getting pushback on the actual 12-inch speaker cones, imagine the pushback you're getting back on the little microphone ribbon. You know what I mean? So the microphones and everything inside that cabinet, it's so loud in that little tiny space, the amount of air that's being compressed up against the microphone renders it broken sounding, basically, you know? So you, it, it's useless. You can't, you can't mic anything inside of an ISO cabinet unless it's literally the size of a room, okay? So like what we did with, because even though I, I took everything direct off Jerry from Alice, um, we had a Royer up there for the monitor guy and so what we did, we just took a four by 12 and put it off upstage left, not even pointing at the stage, like pointing at the loading dock and put the mic there. And that was the ISO cabinet. It was skull crushingly loud, but it wasn't near anything. We just put it off 
in the back corner and put a mic in front of it. So the mic had somewhere to breathe. You know what I mean? It's that works fine. Like that. Um, huh? Yeah, it's still like that. They still have the what same thing. What? The cabinets are off yeah, stage. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and yeah, they're right, just blow, right. blowing back to whoever's back there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying if you want that sound, if you've got your 100-watt head and you want the thing on six, I mean, as part of your stage sound, you know, that's not realistic. You know, they have two four by twelves with a hundred watts behind each one on six. That's way too loud, you know. Um, but you could take that cabinet off stage and have extension cabinets onto the stage at a more nominal volume if you're trying to get people who have wedges and ears to all play ball together. Okay. Now you can have those two cabinets up on stage that are crushingly loud if everyone is on conventional monitors, okay? And then everyone's got their 19 wedges and side fills and you go to town ACDC style, you know, mm -hmm. it's just keeping everybody in the same page and keeping everyone in the pocket. You can't have one person do something, having one person do something that's disparate from everyone else doesn't work. Sorry. I love <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it's two Daves. So, How the hell did I that hope, happen? I I literally the whole screen went many. blank. Um, yeah, no, you disappeared. So anyway, I hope that answers the question anyway. I don't know why there's two days now. So that's good. <laughs> because one's not enough. Want, you, want, <laughs> you can delete the one that's not me. You want me to delete? <laughs> you want me to eject you? Yeah, sure. Send him out of the shuttle. Wait, wait. Which which one should I delete? The one that's not moving? The one that's not doesn't have a picture of him in it. The one that's just the red D. There okay, you go. Actually, oh, there it dropped go. off. All right. I yeah, literally I don't, don't know what happened. It's like literally the the. It just went away. Like, Dave, the, whole you ever, the whole browser did, and everything went away. Dave, did you ever stand in front of Jerry's cabinet off stage on stage left? Were you ever Sorry, around that, for any of that? Oh, yeah, of course. And, okay. and, I, was, and, was and it, I just did it again. Wasn't it, wasn't it breathtaking over there? Oh, my God. I, yeah, you know, the funny thing is I took uh, – so I went to South Bend, Indiana to shoot a, uh, some videos with Sweetwater, mm -hmm. uh, rig run-throughs with Sweetwater right. Music with him. We did three videos <laughs> while we were there. Right. And, uh, and yes, standing, I, I brought a friend of mine, Sammy Bowler with me, uh, for, for the ride basically. And, yeah. and we walk in at, you know, they're, they're doing sound check and we're just standing. There's two cabinets right behind the, the, yeah. the guitar rig and yeah. just blowing in, in a theater, blowing into the wind. And yeah. we're just, Sam and I are just standing there staring at the cabinets, looking at each other going. Oh man, does that sound good? <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's just an, uh, I won't say anything. Never mind. Um, it's a uh, it's it that is Satan's wind, isn't it? Oh my God, it was heaven. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, of course. That evening, I didn't feel the same way out of it, uh, out of the front of the house. But hey. Yeah. Well, you know, some people are scared, buddy. You know, what are you gonna say? And then, and then, and then I was told later by Jerry, "Why didn't you tell me?" You didn't uh, ask. I'm like, okay, if you wanted me to tell you next time. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come out of nowhere and throw this guy under the bus, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was th – he was. no, I want yeah. you to tell me. I'm yeah. like going, all right. All right. <laughs> if, <laughs> Just, if, if you open a can of worms there. Yeah, yeah. right. I, they, you know, like when I was actually hanging out with him in June in Europe, yeah. you know, uh, I was – Anytime the conversation was heading that way, I would get up and go to the bathroom or go get another bottle of water because I did not want to deal with it. You know what I mean? Right. Because it's really hard to not tell the truth. You know? Because, yes. mm. like, it's just hard. So I just, like, the only way to get out of this is to buy time and lie. And don't put myself in the position of having to lie. You know what I mean? Just change just the talk subject. about yeah. whatever, you know? Well, the, That's the, the only second... thing that was awkward about it. Second guy did better. Did meaning Song. does he's, he's is, not there. is, oh, is okay. doing better. Um, guitars at least sound like the guitar. The guitar. Mm. So, yeah, still not not quite the same. <laughs> well, well, you know. You know. Hmm. Well. Changing uh, gears here real quickly back to the other question I was asking Tom about um, mm. uh, Modeling and Kempers and things like that as mm -hmm. opposed to using real amps. Do you have any thoughts on on that? I mean, yeah, actually I, I, I do and um, I've used them all 
uh, I've done gigs with uh, all of them. Uh, if, if I were to tell you, like, I mean, straight up, the best one sonically is the Kemper, okay? Um, but having said that, I will take a tube amp over any of those any day. And let me explain to you why, okay? Initially, when I first heard Kempers and Axe Effects, um, they sounded really good. I mean, it sounded great, you know? And uh, when I was doing Keith Urban, uh, Brian, the stage uh, right guitar player, who's fantastic. Um, and what a tone, man. He played Les Pauls through 100 watt plexis with a clean drive in front of it. Mm. Perf and it was not a super lead, it was a super bass. It's perfect. It's perfect, right? It was like Les Paul, clean boost, 100 watt plexi, Palmer, 4x12, done. Like perfect, you know? And it was tone was everything you would want it to be. It, it sounded like Malcolm Young with a list. And uh, we, one day, we had to, we had to make like a C backline or some other backline. And we had to do it with fractals, I think. And Brian had dumped his amp, actually had taken his amp, modeled it into the XFX. But did everything you had to do to put his amp in in there, right? And we had two lines go in the front of the house and listen to his gu real guitar rig and listen to the model one. And I'm telling you, man, they sounded exactly the same. It was uncanny. It was spooky how perfect the model one sounded. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Great. So what we did that night after, I think it was after the encore or something, just for testing purposes, we switched his guitar rig over to the fractal, okay? Because we had to ship it the next day or something. The second we did that, I lost his guitar in the mix. Mm. It was gone. Like, it was there. I could tell that there was something on, but I couldn't hear it anymore. I couldn't hear the notes. I couldn't hear any little percussive stuff he did. It was, and I kept turning it up to the point that it was now metering three or four dB hotter than the actual real amp was. I still couldn't get any definition out of it. And that's what I, that's what happened when he started using those things is all those strange overtones that we don't really hear with our ears aren't there. And it makes a huge difference how you, how you perceive things in a mix. That's where all your clarity comes from is that kind of esoteric stuff that some people may say is bullshit, but it's not bullshit. Because I heard a fractal I thought sounded amazing. And then later that night, I was like, I can't hear it. In mm -hmm. a dense mix, it lost its place. Yeah. Okay. And it was not fixable by turning it up 3 dB. All I did was turn up the, the woofily part that I could hear 3 dB. It didn't ever get what I wanted to hear to turn up because it wasn't there. You can't turn up nothing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... That's my opinion on those things. Yeah, there's a depth. It, 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 it goes similarly. Uh, uh, years ago, like someone would give you uh, when, when, you know, the beginning of all this were pods and stuff. Mm. And, um, and someone would give you, uh, like I'd give a mix to mix, a song to mix. And you had some pod guitars in it. And it's sort of, sort of the same exact thing you're saying. Yeah. If you're mixing it. You're pulling up these guitars, and it, they sounded decent. Uh, they were pulling up these guitars, and it's just like, that's too loud. Okay, wait a minute. Wait, that's too low. Now that's too loud. Wait, no. Wait. It's like it's like it's it too loud, sit. but I, it's too loud, but I can't hear it. It won't sit it's right. Too loud, but I can't. It doesn't sit so right. So in, in the like end, this particular song, we just wound up retracking the guitars with my my famous Plexi Marshall. Mm -hmm. And you just put it in the mix. You just brought it up. It was a pop, yeah. kind of a pop song. You just brought it up right yeah. under, and it just sat, and you heard every note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, it, like for example with garbage. That was all fake guitar. I mean, yeah. it was all uh, like pod and all that stuff. But the thing is, that entire mix was that. And the other other application, I now took that element and inserted it into a mix that didn't have any of that other stuff. It was a, a mix of all real stuff. You know what I mean? And I tried to take that and insert it in there. Did not work at all. 
okay? I would have to redo that whole thing with everybody on that page to get that to be right again. You know what I mean? It can't. It just didn't work by putting putting it in, and it was a real eye opener, man. That was a real eye opener to me about that kind of stuff, because I didn't think it would be that dramatic. The difference, and it really was. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking you were going to say that. I mean, it's got a certain convenience about it, obviously, but when it comes right down to it, it is not the same, you know. And it's stuff. I swear, it's just stuff that you don't. It's like you don't hear it. It's weird because if you hear it isolated, can't tell the difference. But in a mix, it does not behave itself. Well, you know, it's, like it's, right, right, right now, my band, it's all fractal. My band, I chase that guitar all damn night, and it's so loud. If you were to like look at it metering wise, or like put your headphones on, the guitar is so loud, and but I can't quote unquote hear it. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, because and, and, and like the same rhythm sound in one song doesn't seem to sit the same in the next song, even though it's the same. It technically shouldn't even be touching it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem I have with those things. They definitely create more work. That's for damn sure. <laughs> you know the the the, the funny thing. Um, it's like uh, it's like watching Metallica these days. Mm -hmm. If you've just heard it, it doesn't sound good anymore. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't have crushing I, guitar yeah. sounds and good stuff. And now you hear since they've switched to the yeah. fractal, and now you've heard it, you hear it, and it's like it's just there's something weird in it. It just are they yeah. both on the fractal? Both of them? Yeah. Yeah, Everybody. no, it's all fractal. Yeah. 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 And it just doesn't sound good anymore. No, it, it doesn't. Sound good anymore. What about yeah, bass? Trujillo is on bass uh, using everything. That too? Really? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, we uh, um, I, I even tell my guitar player now. I'm like, he goes, "Well, I thought you were really sold on the direct guitars." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm sold on direct guitar, plugged into a tube amp." You know what I mean? Like, not a not a fake guitar. You know, mm -hmm. um, he got confused that because I like to get to take the guitar direct, like Palmer style, mm -hmm. Mike No More style, like that. But I want it plugged into a real guitar amp. I'm like, if, if my guy now would just, you know, just had a couple of delays, a chorus, a compressor, and a, like a clean sound, a dirty sound, and one dirty sound, you'd kick up a little bit more, you'd be done, you know? And for pretty much any real rock show, you'd be done with everything I just mentioned, realistically, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? They'd take care of 99% of everything. Yeah. You know? And it's unfortunate, but, you know, I mean, once again, above my pay grade. Yeah. I can, I can recommend, but that's all I can do, you know? So Kelly B asked a question as well. Um, wonder if you feel the same about analog versus digital mix mixing desks. Uh, I, I I have up until recently. Um, I had to switch to digital, otherwise I wouldn't have had a job. You know, so I've been thrust in the world of digital, not by choice. I had to. Um, there was no sound companies didn't stock analog desks anymore. The analog gear was gone. No one's going to ship that big heavy stuff around. So you had to jump ship out of that almost 15 years ago. Um, and it's only now that I feel like sonically from the console outward gear point of view that it's actually caught up to the audio quality um, uh, in the last two years. Um, so I actually think my front of house now, audio wise, which is digital, is as good as the analog stuff used to be okay but i but my point is that it's lagged 15 years behind from when i actually had to start using and it that's the new yamaha console right yeah it is and it's the only one the yamaha the, which one is it the the pm10 ravage PM10. and yeah, that's with um, the rupert neve stuff in it right yeah yes it is yeah yeah um it, it has all it's well it's got all that you know it's got like we were just talking about that those harmonics that you don't hear can be introduced on every channel of that console. And you may not hear it, but I tell you what, when you have them all turned on, you can tell if they're all shut off, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not one of those things about the mix sitting, you know? And this, so this console I'm using now is the first one I've ever used that's really got it together. But I mean, it's an incredibly expensive high-end thing. All the other ones I really don't feel are there yet, especially the stuff that's small and cheap. 
um, it's really terrible sounding. It really is. You know, um, if you're doing something smaller and cheaper, I would I would go online to eBay and find find a Soundcraft from the year 2000 that used to be fifty thousand dollars. It's twenty five hundred dollars now. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. I can buy Soundcraft Series Five on eBay for twenty five hundred bucks. It's the best analog console I've ever used. I love that desk. They're twenty five hundred dollars now. You know, it's unbelievable. <laughs> You know what I mean? But I mean, what am I going to do with this giant thing? Um, I uh, in, I forgot what year, but when I was doing Alice in Chains, um, I had my my profile, my Avid digital design profile, whatever you want to call it, Avid now. Um, and I had my I had my electric show on the console, and I also had the Alice acoustic show on a different session on the console. Um, we played the Ryman in Nashville, and uh, due to logistics, my console had to go away before we did the show. So I had to just throw and go this one show, but it's acoustic show, you know, I'll figure it out. And uh, so I had to get a front of house package from Claire Brothers, but it was the middle of summer and everything was out. And uh, long story short, I ended up with a complete analog front of house to do that show. And it was by a hundred miles, the best sounding Alice acoustic show I ever did. Hmm. I'm, I'm not the best PA I'd ever used. So there you go. Do the math off of that. <laughs> and that and that was a throw and go too. They dialed yeah. it from scratch on a mouse. Right. Problem is, it's not just consoles. It's the the PA's and the yeah. the, the power yeah. amps used now, and the and mm -hmm. and, and the, the the digital snakes and all sorts yeah, of other. Yeah, and, and what's so what's tough about it? The stuff that's really good is prohibitively expensive. Yes, we have it, but we're paying an insane amount of money every week for it. You know what I mean? And if you're buying it outright, it's unbelievable, mm. you know? But for it to be as good as the analog stuff, you have to have, you must have the most high-end stuff there is for it to compete with an old XL3. That's what's funny about it, you know? I have a $144,000 console to compete with this console that's on eBay for 2500 bucks. <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny when you think about it. <laughs> but it just comes down to size? Is that what it is? It's because that this... Board, this other well, board. you know, it, yeah, like this stuff's not made anymore. There's no parts for it. There's no one to maintain it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to start stop working. And stuff on the road takes a beat, man. It stops working. You know, right. And uh, what are you going to do? It's not. It's not maintained anymore. It's like it's like trying to run it, get an update for Windows XP. They don't support it anymore. You know. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of the dumbing of audio. You know, it's 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 like we have all this technology, yet our audio keeps getting worse. Yeah, it's like, that, <laughs> you know, and it, I'm still so, like, and I'm, I'm still like, uh, I not only finally have this beautiful front of house that sounds great, and I'm still plugging it into the speakers that I can't stand, you know, it, so what are you going to do? I guess I can make it as good as I can. See, what's weird now, like Dave, the thing I sent you today, you know, I'm doing the same thing with this band, and I put the headphones on, and I hear the same damn thing out of the headphones, and I'm like, why is that not coming out of the PA? Because that's what I'm sending the PA. You know, right. why is that not coming out of the PA before it was coming out of the PA? It's not anymore, you know, mm. so almost the mix on something I can't hear. So have, <laughs> have, have, have the, the line array systems gotten even worse from where they were? I, I think I, in, I think say 2008 the, the, what now. it is, is there's I what I think that is, there's less choices now and the number and within the finite set of choices, there's only a few that are really good. Got it. You know, and if you don't run into those two or three, uh, you know, it's just a battle, you know. And it shouldn't be a battle anymore. It should be uh, easier than ever, you know. Yeah. And it's definitely not. I feel more challenged mixing today than I maybe ever have in my entire career of doing this. Because hmm. I'm mixing around gear deficiency. You know, because I can tell you back in about the day of big old box PAs and um, a Soundcraft Series 5 and some drummers and DBXs, it sounded better. Yeah. I'm still trying to get it to sound like that. Yeah, that know? Well, that's what we've yeah. talked about before. It was like all the yeah. concerts I saw uh, uh, when I was a kid, which would have been uh, mid 80s, you know? Right. Uh, so from 81. Uh, through 80, you know, what, I don't want to start going bad, yeah. but um, all the stuff, surely from 81 to 90, at least, 
Yeah. Uh, I, it just sounded better. It was yeah, it more. It, it had more impact. It would uh, you 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 know it was aggressive rock band more. would hit you in the chest where you could yeah, feel it, the kick drum hit you and it would go, you could feel it like you were gonna have a heart attack yeah. or something. But it, but tonally it was so much more musical. Yeah. Yeah. Warmer, richer, just just mm -hmm. not harsh frequencies. Now I find right. myself now going to a show and um, it's uh, doesn't seem loud and mm -hmm. uh, but I walk away with my ears hurting. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem loud, but it was certainly annoying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, that's that's challenging working around all that stuff, you know. And unfortunately, it, it takes me away from mixing. You know, they uh, I walked to front of the house to do battle with the PA and not mix. And that's technically not my job, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that's what I don't like about it, you know. And there's certain systems that work that are more cooperative than others. That's for sure, you know. But um. When I still think back to when I used to have an uh, an alpha box system, I was like, yeah. you know, once I had this dialed in by the third day, it was kick ass every single night for the next 200 nights. Mm -hmm. How is it not like that anymore? You know, mm -hmm. it's like we've clearly gone gone backwards somewhere somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's hard work, man. Yeah, it's hard work. Hey, quick question. Uh, Dave, we've had a couple of requests. If you can uh, just walk us through, if you don't mind, the Slash's rig behind you. Uh, there's some wireless units, a Whirlwind selector, uh, and uh, there's some Jubilees uh, that he uses for his dirty sounds. And uh, on top of it, which you can't see the whole thing, is, is a pedal board I just built for him. Um, which has a RJM uh, PBC uh, switcher on it. Uh, and then it has a, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Also on this rack, there's two DD500 delays that are in the loops of the amps. Mm -hmm. And um, on the pedal board, you had like um, a uh, MM4, Line 6 MM4 for like some random modulation. You have a uh, MXR chorus. Uh, you have a the M CAE line driver, you have his little octave fuzz thing that slashes. Does he, does he still have that, that cock wah pedal in there? Uh, on the uh, on the board? No, actually he took that off no. and put the chorus on it this time. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, that's that's about it. The Jubilees are stock? Yeah. Are those, aren't, are those the Jubilees that had the 88s in it or not? No, those are these clean ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, when he, when I was doing Velvet Revolver, the Jubilees we had out there were the clean sound, and they were the eight, they had a KT eighty eights in them. Yeah, yep, yeah, correct. Yeah. And the and still normally on the on the bigger guns rig, right? This is this is a B rig. Right. Uh, on the bigger guns rig, uh, it still has the the clean amps with right. KT eighty eights in them, and they use a compressor in front of the amps, like a rack compressor, to kind of. Pad yeah. down the input a little I bit. That and thing. Like, it was and, like a Yamaha uh, compressor or something. Yeah, some, wasn't something it? like that. I don't remember what it yeah. is. And um, and also the outs of this pedal board go to uh, essentially there's a pair of outs that go to two dirty amps. They're redundant amps. They're on at the same time, um, but uh, if one dies, one's still going. You know. And then right. there's uh, two clean amps. Same thing. Redundant clean amp. If one dies. It's still going, mm. and then a right. uh, talk box out and an acoustic DI out. Yeah, so it actually hasn't changed from the VR days. It's exactly it's about the same, same. Same thing. Yeah, same idea. Yeah, same. Does, very those, few pedals, those, just a few little pedals. And are those the reissue twenty five fifty five or are they old ones? These are old ones. He's got about. Mm. He said that Adam Day said they have about twenty of them. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know when when you go through the the clean sound and the heavy sound. You have, and plus two spares, you got six per rigs, and you have three rigs, there's 18. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it sounds like a lot, but like if you divide it up between three or four rigs, it's right. perfectly nominal, yeah. you know? I guess he uses the older ones because he thinks they sound better? Uh, well, he's got various ones. He has, he has uh, he, and he's not using the, the reissues. I think the reissues sound really good. That's what I think, too. I have one, so. Yeah. 
I haven't I haven't seen the inside of a reissue, so I don't know how accurate. Or I don't know how accurate, accurate it is. I I just know that they sound good. Yeah, I mean Jubilee yeah. sounds good. It's a good sounding amp. Yeah. 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 It's one of the better ones. That's for that, sure. that 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 diode sounds a little bit of a one trick pony to me. It, yeah, gets, a little, you, it gets a little get, tiresome after a minute, but it, it, it is cool. It, yeah, you can't get it real driven. Uh, yeah. You don't expect it to get real driven. I yeah, mean, once again, like not that driven. I mean, they're, they're yeah. not that dirty. Once again, anything that's got the letter M on it, you got to turn it up to six and then do your preamp. You know, yeah. then yeah. then it'll sound good. You know, it's nothing. Nothing's ever changed with that company. That thing's always stayed the same. Turn the master up really loud, and then bring the preamp in. It'll right, sound right, good. Right, 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 you know right. what I mean? Especially on that app, like on your amps, you can have the master volume down, and it still sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, it still sounds linear. You know what I mean? Um, mm. uh, but on the Marshalls, they just sound like a buzz box unless you turn up the master volume, you know? Yeah. Yep. That is true. All right. Well, thanks for walking us through that. I hope Nick Mars, uh, hope that answered your question. Um, how are you doing on time, Tom? Just wanted to I'm, I don't, I'm not doing anything. I'm just hanging out. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, here's a good question from David Vivar. Uh, what do you, uh, when you're at home, what do you listen to? What kind of music are you into? Oh, uh, I, I, I love listening to music. I listen to music constantly. I actually really don't watch TV or anything. Um, I still love music, and that's the reason I do this. Probably the reason I've been able to do it for so long is I really do love music, and I love to play guitar. It's never ever changed. Um, I like a lot of different stuff. Uh, it's pretty all over the place too. Um, I have like classic bands that I always love, like that are like my bands. It'd be like the same big bands that Dave loves, you know, like Mark II, Deep Purple, you know, early Rainbow, early Aerosmith, you know, all that stuff, the great rock bands from the 70s. I love all that stuff. Mm. Um, uh, just stuff I've been listening to. Like I, I've somehow ended up listening to stuff that, I know some people kind of consider singers songwriting, but I don't know. I just like good songs. Um, there's a singer girl. Her name's Meg Myers, who I really like. Um, uh, I've been listening to uh, what? This a record? What the hell? I've been listening to like crazy. Like oh, um, I read. I've rediscovered the band The Cardigans. I love that band. What incredible songs and amazing production. Mm -hmm. um, it's all in the realm of kind of rock, pop rock, um, but some of it's a little more poppy or acoustic-y than you might expect. Um, I used to really be into Southern rock too. I actually was in a Southern rock tribute band for a while, um, but I kind of got burnt out on it. And like, I got kind of burnt out on Led Zeppelin too. Um, the, uh, there's a couple like smaller rock bands that I really like. There's a band from Sweden called Mama Ken that I really like. You gave um, me that. Yeah, it's a great yeah. record. Um, there's a band from Atlanta called uh, Asphalt Valentine that I really like. I really like um, uh, Rich Robinson's new band, Magpie Salute. Um, I've heard that. Rich from the, Black, from the Black Crows, the guitar mm -hmm. player from the Black Crows. Um, I really like his new band, and their record uh, is really good. Hmm. Um, Check that out. It's funny, like, you hear the, uh, you know, the cool, heavy Black Crows songs that you like? Yeah. Uh, you, know, you ever wonder who wrote them? Listen to the Magpie Salute and go, oh, Rich wrote them. <laughs> yeah, you, you get it all of a sudden. Um, I really like that. I've been listening to, to that stuff a lot. Um, I, I kind of like a, a, a little bit of like Americana rock, too, you know? Um, I don't listen to a ton of heavy stuff anymore, but when I do, when I do listen to something heavy, it's always hmm. Rammstein. Hmm. Always Rammstein. Love that band. That, that, that's I, awesome. I love that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the great. This, I just love everything about that band. I love the way it sounds. I love the heaviness. I love the silliness. There's a great sense of humor that runs through that band, which I think is really great. Um, Actually, you know what? I could do this show. This would be a lot easier to answer this question. Isn't that? It's weird when someone asks you that question, how hard it is for you to answer it. So you listen to music all day. It's really weird. But I have this little fun folder here that makes me a lot easier to answer. Uh, uh, do you know a band called Biffy Clyro from Scotland? Mm -mm. No. 
uh, love that band. Probably my new, they're not really a new band. They've been around for a minute. They've been around for about 12 or 15 years. They're called Biffy Clyro, Scottish band. Absolutely incredible. They have a record called Opposites, which is amazing. Um, I highly recommend that record to anybody. Uh, Biffy Clyro is awesome. Uh, there's a band from Essex in the UK called Nothing But Thieves. who are actually just starting a tour over here in America. And if you can go see them, they're doing a club tour. You should definitely go. Uh, Nothing But Thieves from the uh, UK. They're fucking incredible. Um, <laughs> Biffy Clyro, Nothing But Thieves. These are more current stuff uh, that I've been listening to. Uh, I've kind of uh, revisited the Wallflowers, too. They're later records. Uh, really like that. Uh, yeah, there's a Swedish band called The Sounds. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Mm -hmm. I love them. I listen to them a lot too. But it's kind of more mi mi middle of the road rock, you know, kind of stuff. I still cool. always love the always love the Wild Hearts. One of my favorite bands ever. Mm -hmm. uh, always cheap trick. They oh, will yeah. shall never die. Love Soul Asylum, like crazy. I like uh, the Soul Asylum, the more rocking Soul Asylum. Yeah, stuff. totally. Yeah, totally. Um, I like some Blackstone Cherry quite a bit. Uh, what else have I been listening to here? Hmm. I, I think the two most exciting things are Nothing But Thieves and Biffy Clyro. Uh, the most current exciting stuff is is that Stuff that's not like more retro that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, that's cool. Concrete Blonde. Love Concrete Blonde. One of my favorite bands. Um, oops, Wolfhard oh. started playing. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, so I mean, there you go. That's cool. I've been spinning a lot um the Ultraphonics record. What is it? Ultraphonics, George Lynch's new band with uh, oh, okay, right with with Corey Glover, right. Oh, that's good. It's real good, real good stuff. Um, man, if you, I'm looking at my recently played, and it just looks like I haven't dry, I haven't gotten out of the '80s. <laughs> <laughs> just I'm yeah, I've also been feel, feeling the steel a lot, a lot of Steel Panther too. When I need to laugh. Oh uh, yeah, and of course. And of course, my favorite walking through an airport record that I always play in an airport, Rain and Blood, my favorite airport record. <laughs> There's just something about the anger in that record that fits with walking through an airport. <laughs> that record that? more what, than any other record. What was that band record. you sent me that does the Bee, Gees, uh, the Bee Gees covers? Oh, Tragedy. Oh my God, that's a great... <laughs> That's yeah, just fun. There's a, there's, there's a band from New York called Tragedy that does metal covers of Bee Gees songs. Wow. But they do it cool. so good, man. It's really so good. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Called, they're called they're called Tragedy and the record's called We Rock Sweet Balls. <laughs> <laughs> they're amazing. The reason I got to know them is because when I was doing the Wild Hearts in the UK, they were the support act. Uh -huh. That is a fun evening of rock right there. Hey Dave, what was the name of the band? I've oh it's Seduce, right? Your friends from Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Did they ever put out a new record? They're they're going to be working on something uh, uh, okay. shortly here. Yeah, the, they're actually the, wor reworking some stuff and going to go in and yeah. record some stuff. You no, know, the guitar sounds on that original record were fucking awesome. The very first one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a black and white cover, right? Yep, yep, yep. With them on yeah. the cover, kind of. Yeah. yeah, I love the tones on that record. Man. I I actually rebought that uh, original copies of it on vinyl. I went, yeah. I went on a mission to look look for it. Yeah. Do you, do you remember the band called Raven? Yeah, sure. Do you remember that record called All for One? And yeah, he, he had it. He played, he played tellies through Marshalls. Yes. He was in a metal band. Dude, but it sounded incredible. Yeah, no, Raven, yeah. All the all those early Krang bands, as, as, yeah. as we call it. You know, like your Krang magazine. Well, they, were all, they were all recorded at Pyramid Sound down at the south end of the lake from where I was born, down oh, in Ithaca, yeah. New York. Yeah, they, all, that's where all those Metal Blade records were made ah. with Alex Alex Periellis down in 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 Ithaca. Yeah, by Ithaca College. I totally. Uh, that's what, 
And Rob Hunter, the drummer, became the engineer at that studio when oh, yeah? Raven was no more. Yeah. Huh. But that all, that all for one record, the guitar tone's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. And that, re- that's, a straight, that's a straight telly through a Marshall, man. I, that's why yeah. I rebought it the other day. I like re listened to one clip on YouTube and went, oh, yeah, I got to have this because I love t- heavy, a heavy telly sound. Yeah. Fucking great. You know? I do that routinely. I'll like remember something and then like go, go find it again and listen to it for yeah. a second and then go on. Wait, where, where, click? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I still support music and buy it. Oh, me too. I pay I'm for everything. I'm not a Spotify, yeah. like, I'm not a Spotify guy. I won't, I won't. Yeah. Do it. Pay for everything, man. Um, the, uh, yeah, Raven, all for one. That's the record, man. Yeah. That's cool. I remember that. Uh, Robert Baker's in the chat. We Robert, were... I haven't even watched the video yet, Robert. I was about to watch the video, and then I came over to do this. Yeah, I was about to watch it, too, and then I got sidetracked. So, Yep, I have not watched it yet either, but I, I hear good things about the video. Robert, we'll check it out. Um, and uh, he mentions the new Slash song is amazing. Haven't heard that with Miles Kennedy. Um did, oh, you yeah, see that's, the, did you see that? It's really good. I heard that. It's really good. The, the one where the guitars sound kind of clean, I think, is the one he talks about. But it's mm. the reason it's killer is the guitars do sound kind of clean. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think it's the one that there's like a kind of a video for up on their 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 homepage, YouTube page, or whatever. It's a really cool song. I'll have to check it out. Dave, yeah. did you go see them the other night at, at the whiskey? No. Oh, okay. Uh, just yeah, could have probably have done it, but I was working on uh, the other night. I was essentially, let's see, until I'd been working three weeks straight, one day shy of three weeks when I finally got a day off. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so Sunday was my day off, and yesterday was the first time in fucking three weeks. So. Jeez. So I was I was pretty much not really in the mood by that point to do anything. Right. Really? <laughs> you know, I just I just needed uh, you know I needed a recoup day. Because we did all the all the new Alice in Chains back lines and then Slasher's back line. And it was, you know. A lot of work. Yeah. They finally did another back line. I've only been talking about it since two thousand and ten. For Allison Chains or yes. Slash? Okay. That, that, that's, about, that's about the right speed. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the funny thing was, is like all of a sudden there was that to do out of the blue. They decide to do it. Give me a price again, which I've done in the past. And, uh, and then they decide, okay, we're going to do it. And then you got, okay, you got to hear this time frame to do it in. Oh, good. <laughs> it's a short time frame, and um, and what that means uh, is, you know, it's two racks. So right. it's it's a backup. It's a it's a rig and a backup. So it's I built two systems. So um, you know that's uh, that's a lot of work. I think you know sixty hours. I think in total. Billable mm. hours or something like that. So yeah, it's a lot of work. A lot of work, and you know, you know, sixty hours is that's that's you know, you have forty hours in a week. The thing is, you don't work eight hours straight. So uh, uh, you know, you you're really putting in more like seven hours a day, maybe, if you're, maybe. Yeah, it's a lot. Yep. Now, yeah. is it only you working on it, or you have other people? No, working? that would be two people working. Mm-hmm. To get it done, otherwise it wouldn't be done. Right. Last time I was there, you, I think you only had one person there besides you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would, yeah, well, yeah. That would be Jamie, who's yeah. who's been with right. me on and off for since God. Uh, it goes way far back. Right. Hey, Mark, you just get an email from me. I did. Okay. I can't wait to. That's the link. That's that Dropbox file. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. By the way. Yeah, and. Uh, so yeah, so by that point in time, Mark, yeah, no, I'm not ready. I'm not going to go out anywhere. I'm burnt. <laughs> You're like, I'm okay, burnt the hell out, and I just, you know, I'm ready to kill everyone. Yep, I understand. Trust me. 
but it all, you know, sound, it all, it's, it's all sounds glorious and, and glamorous until you have you to know, do it. You it, know, it's funny when stuff like big stuff like that happens, what tends to happen is um, at the same time, out of the blue, a million other people want stuff done at the exact same time frame. Mm -hmm. So, so it was, it was Alice and Slash, and there's another rig sitting here, and there were two other pedal board jobs, and it literally, they all dropped exactly at the same time. It's like when it rains, it pours. You know that saying? Mm -hmm. Well, that's happened over the years, all the time. When you get the really big yeah. job, that's when they drop five other jobs on top of you at the same time. <laughs> I've always said if, if there was three of me, I could have retired 10 years ago. Yes. Because I always get I always get three tours at the exact same time. <laughs> always. You know, when having just sat for three months, you know? Cloning. Cloning always. would be good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I would like to get three of me so those three guys could go make money and I could just sit at home with a dog. And play know? guitar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just watching Gilligan's Island with a guitar on my lap. <laughs> Hey, we um, we had a question uh, from Carson Depp. Tom, have you ever worked with harmonica players? Can you discuss some of the challenges Harmon there? Harmonica yeah, har players? Yeah. Oh, uh, the, how I normally deal with that is it's just logistically wise. You're usually the lead singer, and the usually just because of the speed of a the show, they're just going to blow right into their vocal mic. Okay, so basically. Uh, with with the digital console, I just have another EQ overlay that I pop on for those moments, and then pop it back off when they're done. That's really all there is to it, you know. And if it requires another plugin, a saturation plugin, over some time or something like that, I can just snap. If it's more than one move, I could snapshot that small move and just pop it in and out for when uh, when it needs to be done. If you're dealing in an analog realm, um, you're probably going to have to uh, take that channel and wire it to another channel and create a harmonica channel off that same microphone that's EQ'd or compressed, EQ'd and compressed differently than the vocal because the harmonica will be invariably be quite a bit louder than the vocal. So you also want to make sure you leave yourself enough input headroom to accommodate the vocal and the harmonica. Mm. The harmonica will rip your head off at about one and a half K. So you're going to have to create a big cut there that you would never would on a vocal. Right, right. That's really it, though. It's just popping a different real EQ treatment and compression treatment onto the channel for when the person uh, uses, blows the harmonica down the vocal mic. Now, some people, you might have a separate, like, you know, harp style mic. Um, but I only find that ever to ever show up if you have a legitimate, like, this is our harp player. You know what I mean? And he plays with us all night. You know, then you don't have to do all that crazy EQ stuff because he's going to be blowing into a mic that's tailored for that kind of sound. But rarely does that ever actually happen, you know, because I just in the bands that I tend to do, which are more in the heavy rock kind of realm, there's not too many harmonica players. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Leonidas. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce your last name right. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, new new Alice in Chains was some of the best. Uh, I, I've heard some of it. I haven't listened to the whole thing. Um, it definitely sounds really good. So definitely good stuff. Have you heard it, Dave? Anyone else? Uh, uh, yeah, I bought it. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, some of it is great, I think, and uh, and I'm gonna say that maybe sonically, it's not their best record. I think it did. Nick do this record again? He's done all these yeah, last three. Different right? mixer, yeah. Didn't different mixer this time. Uh, all right. Yeah, and and there's a common thread. Uh, there's a common thread. Uh, Is there? Like the two records before, Black Gives Way to Blue, and yeah. Dinosaur, whatever, uh, were mixed by. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, now it's escaping me. It was on the tip of my tongue two minutes ago. <laughs> was it mixed by Joe? No, it was mixed by. Um, um, damn it. <laughs> His name Joe? Damn it! No, no. no this the new one's Joe Barisi. All oh, right, that, that's the new one's Joe Barisi, oh, yeah. which sounds very different than the other yeah. kind of mixes. Right. Uh, well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sometimes Joe's hit hit and miss. 
Sometimes, sometimes it's really great. Yeah, this one sounds kind of like thin. I like there was a yeah there was a record he did that I really loved, and he mixed the, the that same band's next record, and it was real papery sounding to me, and I was like, that's weird, you know, same guy, yeah, same I band. I don't really know because I don't all. F- I mean, I know I'm I'm not comparing to anything he's done, so I'm not really sure, but yeah. um. But yeah, I, I I prefer the sound of the other two records. But it, yeah. there's some cool songs and there's some cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And like in yeah, context, heard, if you're just that. listening to it, it's 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 good for sure. Yeah. Um, and those songs come off some of the songs, like the very first single they released. Uh, when you, it's funny. A lot of people kind of bagged on it, but when you hear that song live, boy, does it come off good. It just Which one? really worked. Um, the uh, first single they did, the 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 one you oh, love okay. or something or yeah or something like that. Uh, yeah. Hey, dude, you know what I you know what I found that I have to give you that was really amazing and one of the best mixing moments of my life, and I completely forgot about it until I stumbled across it. I don't think it's with me. I think it's out on the, in in the truck um, on the tour. Um, I found uh, Shooter Jennings singing down in a hole. Oh really? It, it's incredible, like wow. incredible, like wow. goosebump, incredible. Yeah, like wow. I'll have to get that to you. I know where it is, I because I came across it in the last month or so. Huh? Okay. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, Aaron Cram has a question, Dave. I don't know if you know that the answer. What does Jerry use at home? Uh, for an amp. Uh, I definitely not toilet paper. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a funny story about the toilet paper, though. Hold on, <laughs> uh, hold hold for that story. So um, no, he has a uh, he uses a funny thing at home. He has a, a, a Jet City amp I modified for him. Hmm. So I it's still it's one still of the sound- ones, one of the little ones that you modded. Yeah, the twenty watt. Yeah, yeah, uh, those things sound great. Uh, just a little lamp at home. He has that, and uh, I, I modded it to be very similar to his, you know, normal sound and stuff. That's cool. So he has a small home studio. Um, uh, it doesn't do a lot of, you know, playing at home, you know. Uh, but uh, but the funny thing about the toilet paper is uh, the best use ever. At, he has a bathroom at his house. And you walk in the bathroom and you see an MTV uh, video award mm-hmm. on the floor, and uh, <laughs> next to, next to the toilet, and it holds the toilet paper. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So it's a, it's all you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, I know exactly yeah, you what you're talking about. Really, uh, it's like, uh, and I'm I'm like the first time I saw that, I'm like, oh my god, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is great. Um, so uh, Johnny Ryle asks, "What do you think of the new Stone Temple Pilots album?" I actually love it. I think it's oh, great. it's really yeah. good. Yeah. We it's just cool. did a we just did five shows with them. Oh yeah, yeah. It was They're really great. fun. We had a really good time. Did you come down to Florida and do that show? No, we played uh, like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Mm. Right up, right up in there. We did five gigs. They played right before us. We closed. They played right before us. It was really good. I mean, maybe because we all know each other so well, we had a really good time. But uh, yeah, they're pretty much better than they've ever been because they got yeah. a real singer now. They're you know? killing. Yeah, they sound great. Or a func- yeah. They have a functional singer, put it that way. Yeah, I mean, well, Scott Weiland could sing, but he just <laughs> well, he didn't know I he'd show he'd up. Differ. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I mean... I, I think the new guy actually. Remember? Don't you remember? Don't you remember? I killed that band too. <laughs> right. April first, two thousand eight. I did their last show. I just, I did their last show. Or are we talking about Velvet Revolver? Or uh... yeah, VR, the Heineken Music Hall in Amsterdam, last VR show. Never, never to be heard again. And I also did the Royal Machines when he was singing in the band, the All Star Band, like. So What's the bass? What the, the bass player that's on every record, and Brooks Wackerman and Gilby Clark and 
Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, uh, Chris Cheney. Chris Cheney was on bass. Yeah, right. So Chris Cheney and, and yeah. Billy uh, and Billy Morrison and. Uh, and so what's the week? I did three Freeze, weekends with them. Right? My, yeah, right. So what's my first weekend with him? Of course, who's the guest singer? It's him. It's like I can't get rid of him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I have there was so a, there, many stories to tell about that guy that are so funny, but I can't do it here. It's there, I can't. It's not appropriate. But so much comedy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask this question and then uh, I'm going to run to the restroom real quick. Uh, Big Pappy wants to know, Tom, what's your favorite speakers and favorite mics? Speak like speaker system. Uh, my favorite speaker system is the L Acoustics K1. Uh, coming in a close second, I really like uh, the uh, JBL VTX system. Uh, microphones, it's funny, and Dave kind of knows this, I don't use a whole lot of mics anymore. If I could take something direct, I definitely will. But, you know, we always still have to mic a drum kit and stuff, and I'm still pretty conventional about that. Uh, a kick will be a Beta 91A and some kind of big diaphragm mic, like uh, uh, like a uh, Shure uh, Beta 52, which I don't really love, but they're usually around. Uh, I prefer a Bayer M88 as the outside mic. Um, and just something low profile for the toms, as long as it sounds decent. Um, uh, 57s on the snare, AKG 414s on the overheads. And, and the same for the hats and the ride. I, I actually like a big diaphragm condenser on the hat. I think it sounds better. And uh, I don't use mics on guitars or bass or anything ever. Like, I do everything direct. Uh, so I don't really use mics on guitars anymore. Um, the last mic combination I ever used, which is a long time ago, uh, was either uh, an SM57 with a ribbon mic or an SM57 with an AT Audio Technica 4050 condenser. But once again, I've been doing that with Palmer's and radial JDX's and soon to be Dave's box for ever now, 15 years. Um, you like the Heil PR22, uh, right? I, I, for a I used to. I've kind of gone off of them now. Uh, vocally, what I do with vocals is I just find the mic the singer sounds good into. Um, and that could be almost anything. Uh, it's something I have to determine early on. And then the backup vocals will become replicants of that microphone. You know, um, Like, for example, the band I'm doing now, oddly enough, out of all the stuff I can pick and choose, which is anything, our singer sounded best into a Beta 58, which is kind of weird. I haven't used that in years. But we, we tried everything and stuff that I really liked, and he just didn't sound right into anything but that. And so since he was singing into that, I just did all the backup vocals in wired versions of that mic. And uh, yeah, so nothing, nothing too weird. Uh, all very conventional, well-known type of stuff. Uh, I have some singers that sound good into the Telefunken. Some singers that sound good into the, uh, the newer uh, Shure, the, the one that's really expensive. It's like 500 bucks. Um, SM7? Is it just? No, SM7 is the radio mic. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's the condenser that's the new one that everyone uses now, SM50, which sounds really good, that mic. No, no, it's a brand new handheld condenser. I was using it on Silver Sun Pickups, which is another fucking great band that I got to mix, was that band. Um, really great songs. Um, I didn't really like doing the tour, but I really liked their songs. Um, and I had him singing into that new Shure microphone, uh, which was fantastic sounding. Um, but like my guy right now didn't sound good into that mic. So, yeah, I just vocally, I just try to find what the lead singer sounds good into, and I'll replicate that across the background vocals and the drum kit, just the conventional stuff that I said, you know. Uh, I, I, if I can get a big diaphragm condenser on the toms, I'll go that route. Uh, I do like the Shure uh, KSM 27s on toms, but that can be a little over the top because that's like putting a big diaphragm condenser on every tom. Um, which might be not realistic for some people, just financially speaking. Um, but any of the smaller clip-on dynamics are okay, like the Sennheiser ones are fine. Um, the large diaphragm Hiles are really good for that. Uh, 
And the, the small Sure uh, Theta 87s, the little clip-on condensers, those are good too. And really, that's it. You know, not, nothing too weird. Okay. Do you have any experience, uh, Johnny Ryle wants to know, with uh, Audix mics? Yeah, yeah. Audix mics are, um, there's nothing wrong. They're good. They're a good live microphone. Um, for years, when I did uh, Garbage, uh, sure, that was surely anything you hear was surely singing live between 1998 and 2005 was an Audix OM5 because that's what she sounded good into. And once again, we could use anything, but she sounded good into an OM5. Um, OM5 is a really good microphone if you have a very competitive stage and it's raucously loud and you're, you need the vocal to cut and to get out front. It's not the greatest sounding mic, but you can get it really loud. Um, it has a really good gain before feedback, the OM5 does. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, the, uh, and their, their dynamic drum mics are, are good too. They're fine. Um, they're not better than, excuse me, anything else, but they're definitely not lesser than anything else. Um, I like that D6 kick mic's pretty good. Their small, low profile dynamics for the snare are actually pretty cool. I've actually used them in conjunction when I've doubled mic. If I had a troublesome snare drum and I had, wanted to double mic the top, I would generally use the little Audix with a 57. Um, but yeah, Audix mics are cool. The, the um, Audix dynamics are cool. I, I think the Audix condensers are really ratty sounding, to be honest. Mm. There you go. Okay. Uh, Dixie Devil qu question, and I don't, I haven't heard of these folks. So, um, have any of you worked with High on Fire or Matt Pike? No. Uh, no, I. I, I have heard of the second one, but not the first one, but I don't know anything about it other than having heard of it. Okay. Um, oh, here's one. Okay. What are some of the challenges of mixing bands that play in the round? Oh, that's challenging. <laughs> uh, the biggest challenge is this, is uh, you are... Uh, taking long throw PAs and you're blowing them into a wall that's only 50 feet away um, because you've the conventional PA hang in an arena, you know, uh, you know, the stages here in front of the house is at about a hundred to 100 feet and behind front of the house to the back is about 150. Okay. Well, in the round, the farthest you're shooting is maybe 80 feet, usually about 50. And, at that point, the PA is not very wide. Um, so you need a monstrous amount of PA to cover it horizontally because the PA hasn't had enough distance to get wide yet because um, the audio shoots out like a, like a horizontal garden hose. You know, it's not 110 degrees wide the second it comes out of the box. Um, it needs room to disperse. And so you need a ton of PA, and then you, your reflections are really loud because in a conventional arena, by the time something hits a wall, it's somewhat dying out and it's not nearly as loud as it was when it came out of the box. Okay. But in, uh, in the round, when something's slapping into a wall, it's the reflection's really loud because what's hitting the wall is really loud because it just came out of the speaker like 10 milliseconds ago because it's so close to the speakers. So the problem is, yeah, your reflections in the round are incredibly loud. And so sometimes that'll make your shows incredibly loud because you're in a constant battle to not hear the reflections and only hear the PA. So you're trying to get up over the reflections and you have that little bit of a battle. It's not linear. Like what will happen is you turn something up. You would think that the reflections would turn up linearly but they don't um they start to turn up in different frequencies and then there can be a point where you can be louder than the reflections but sometimes that's so beyond loud that you can't deal with it so that's those are the main challenges of in the round and another thing that's challenging within the round is something logistically speaking as your cabling and stuff is not generally off the truck ever set up to do something that runs the length of the arena it's set up to go across the arena like this and so, yeah, the guys have to put up a crazy amount of cable bridges because in the round, remember, you can't have the amp racks underneath the hang anymore. They all have to be down at one end. And so there's tons of speaker cable going from one point in the arena 
to all these speaker hangs that are all the way around. So you have the cable management's crazy, you know. And there's obviously a lot of a lot of rigging in places that you don't normally rig off of. So you know, a lot of these places have a grid at the stage on, but there's not too much of a grid out in into the arena floor. So the rigging can be very difficult too, you know, where you hang everything from the ceiling because there may not be provisions to hang anything there. Mm-hmm. And those are definitely the biggest challenges. Okay. Um, another question, is it typical that the PA is brought by the artist or usually by the venue? Uh, it depends on the size of the gig. Uh, most, I will say, generally speaking, most theater shows to smaller are locally provided audio. Um, whether that's brought in from a local audio company to that venue that day, or whether it's a house rig in that venue, the PA has generally been sourced in that city. Okay, um, theater shows and bigger generally the PA is being carried by the artist. Okay, I have a question here. I have no idea what it means, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, L. Scott Music says, Tom, what did you think when Shirley became a Terminator? <laughs> you know, you know? I, I had, I know what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, I was never scared of her then. I'm not scared of her now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so if, lost. If you know her, if you, explain if, later. If you, he explains later. Look, Mark. If you know, if you know, uh, if you know her personally, uh, she's, the most non-Terminator person you could ever meet. She's absolutely, utterly thoughtful and sweet. And I do mean that. Oh, sure. Oh, I got you. Okay, Shirley Manson was in yeah. Terminator. Okay, gotcha. God, I, I didn't want to ask the question unless I understood what it meant. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, El Scott Music. I, it, it's good to keep it mysterious for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I was lost there for a second. Okay, I got it. That's I didn't know fun. that. Shirley Manson. I, I didn't know that actually until right now either. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. Now, Just now, Google, Google, Google. Now I kind of need to watch Google the movie. Image It. <laughs> Just Google Image It. No, I know Rob Zombie has uh, some of his family in some of his movies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. His daughter and like uh, wife mm-hmm. or something, right? No, yeah. Maybe his wife. Yeah, I think so. That's awesome. Um, I love Rob Zombie movies. Yeah, they are, I've never the, actually seen one. They oh. they are the most twisted, utterly over the top movies ever. Love them. <laughs> the ho- the Halloween remake, the Halloween one was amazing. Amazing, yeah. I really have to say, and I grew really? up with the original oh, Halloween. Really good, yeah. It really is fucking great. The original Halloween is awesome, but this like takes it to a whole nother level. Wait, Tom, you never seen like the Devil's Rejects or anything like that? No, I've never, I've, oh, I, I've never seen any dude. of them. I'll make it a point too, if you think make I should. Make it a point I, to I, watch I, them. Though. I had, I had conflicting opinions from the one you just expressed in the past, so I just kind of waved it off. Halloween or Devil Rejects? What's that? The Halloween one or the Devil's Rejects? I, 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 any of them? Oh. Oh, so anything? No, that it just, it's just like now. Nah, he just, he just, um, it's just over the top uh you know um it's taking everything one step farther than maybe it should go (laughs) which is what makes it great (laughs) yeah in a very realistic way in a very realistic gory effed up way you know like so what you're saying it's like when when i line check a rhythm guitar it's just a little more than it should have gone right Yeah, oh yeah, far. House of a Thousand Corpses was the first one. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, I've heard of that. I've heard of that for sure. I remember taking my 13-year-old daughter at the time to see that. Really? <laughs> yeah. I I I damage him was, you know, I try to damage him early. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. She also she also <laughs> got to go see or, or she also got to go see I remember seeing uh she was maybe 11 or something, and I took her to see The uh, Offspring uh, with Cypress Hill opening up. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> and Cypress Hill just going, you know, like just swearing and going crazy, and it was just like, 
She loved it. So do, <laughs> you know who played with us? At, you know who played with us at the German festivals back in June? Hmm. Bont. Wait, what? Sorry, I, I didn't even know that. I, I body count played with us oh, in Germany. Yeah. No, dude. I have you not, seen? Didn't know that was a thing. Have you? I seen, did. I no, saw it five it, times. It's a thing again. Um, uh, it huh? went away for a while, but body count's back again. And really? Oh yeah. Heard dude. some of it. Like it's this song. Bizarre. It's it was great. What 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 I saw they were playing mostly cover songs. Well, uh, they they had a song. Uh, uh, what's the recent song that they did? I, I remember Pete Thorne was telling me he goes, "You got to see this video." <laughs> uh, I I should look for the video because it was really quite funny. And uh, and uh, and it was like uh, or maybe they oh maybe it was this cover songs. They did they do a Slayer song or something? Oh yeah, two of them. Yeah, yeah, maybe it was. They open, I, up, they open up with they open up with a uh, rain and blood or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have a long history with that band. Actually, like years ago when they first came out, I did guitar rigs for the guitar players. Oh uh, yeah, like, yeah one way, of the way, way, players, way back. The first time they did one of the guitar. It. One of the guitar players is the OG guitar player. Yes, Ernie. Ernie C. Yep. One of the one one of them is like young. I think the other guitar player is like the son of somebody, or maybe something oh, the, like the, that. The, the, the OG guitar player is Ernie C. Uh, he's been around. The, the guy on stage right is is the OG guy. Right. Yeah. And uh, and the, the other original guy died. Hmm. Oh so right. He's, he's he does. He's no longer with us. Yeah. Way back in the nineties, <laughs> I did rigs for them. You know that theater. You know that theater that's over here in North Hollywood. That uh, that's old theater that's on the corner of Weddington and Lancashire. Uh, uh, it, it's now like more of a playhouse than anything theater. But um, I don't. I don't before, think before before that theater was remodeled uh, and kind of gussied up when it was a shithole. Uh, yeah. Body Count in the '90s played there. <laughs> oh, and I remember seeing him there, dude. So, so check this out. And and we did like Rock and Ring and Rock and Park and the festivals with them, right? Yeah. Well, they did some like one-off shows in Germany. They were playing matinees. They were playing at five and nine, like Elvis Presley style. Like, wow. I'm like, is Colonel Tom Parker your manager? You know, <laughs> <laughs> the bo the body count matinee. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, I haven't heard about someone doing a matinee like since before I started going to gigs. Oh, here someone someone said like I, I so someone said here David Vivar said Soundgarden covered Cop Killer back in the early days. Hmm. Uh, the um, I was trying to uh, was it uh, Velvet Revolver the uh, the uh, the intro tape was Fuck the Police N.W.A. Yep, I remember that. <laughs> Wild, I had no idea. Dave, uh, right now I am uh, the link to the folder, right? You do what? You still have the link to that folder, right? That Dropbox. Oh uh, yeah, I should. Okay, because uh, right now I'm I found that's what I was dicking on my phone. I found the shooter Jennings down in a hole. Oh okay. I'm pushing that song to the folder now. And you too, Mark, that the straggler song in there will be Shooter Jennings uh, singing down in a hole, and it's fucking incredible. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Also, Dave, I don't know if you remember when I was doing the band. Do you remember the pick slide in that song? Yeah. That I used to really enjoy, that I used to enjoy a little too much. <laughs> uh, I, on, on, the, on this recording, I'm enjoying it way too much. Okay. <laughs> I'll just I'll just leave it at that, okay? Got it. Cool. I'm like Angus Young. You got nothing on this pick slide. <laughs> uh, we've got a question from Leonidas. Sure. He says, "So I'm a dumb guitarist. Couldn't I just put my 100 watt amp in front of me and kind of to the side dial in it, dial it in and turn it up, and everyone would hear it fine as long as the place wasn't huge." Um. You prefaced saying you were a dumb guitarist. I didn't say it, okay? <laughs> um, 
the, what the problem with that is uh, at distance and with a 4 by 12 it's not much distance either. You are not getting full frequency response at distance, okay? As you start to walk away from a 4 by 12 the only thing it's projecting at 5 feet, you lose 120 cycles down. At 10 feet, it's about 200 cycles up. So when you get about 20 feet back, all basically it sounds like your guitar is plugged into a bullhorn, okay? So as you walk away from your guitar rig, what's, you're not getting full frequency response at distance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Did mm -hmm. I say that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from the point you're actually, people are going to actually be hearing your guitar, what they're going to be hearing is going to sound like, like this. It's going to be all high mid. Because the low end and stuff does not carry out of that box more than, honestly, it's barely 10 feet. Right, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. Um, what home audio equipment do you have at home to listen to music? Hey, here's a, there's a, this is a funny joke. Um, there's another guy I work with named really good engineer. His name is Brad Maddox. And uh, we always yeah. joke that front of house guys always have the worst stereo systems. Like <laughs> Brad still has his Radio Shack rig from college. Okay. And uh, I still have the audio for my TV hooked up to the TV speakers. Right. And I actually don't own a stereo. God, God is my witness. <laughs> I, have a, I have a little Bluetooth speaker. Hair buds I bought from Amazon. Uh, I have some nice headphones, never put them on. And if I really want to listen to something, I actually use my little home studio studio monitors, which are um, y Yamaha a HSM 7s. That's but exactly I what honestly, I, have. I don't have, yeah, I actually don't have a stereo. And I also have a pair of uh, uh, Tannoys that I might actually make into just my home stereo, but I actually don't have one right now. <laughs> That's what I did. That's what so I the, did. I took a pair yeah, of the, old Tannoys. So the joke is like we 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 go out and work with like billions of dollars of audio gear, and we go home and like we're worse than college kids, you know. That's funny. Um, it's true. Most of the time, I'm listening to my music out of my monitors, the Yamahas. Um, but I do have a Bose stereo system in the living room. I probably the most full range music I'm listening to is behind the wheel of a car. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. I will actually go out and drive just to listen to music because uh, I enjoy doing that because I live in the desert. And if I want to listen to a whole record, I'll just take a car out, out, on, out into the desert for an hour, you know, and which is a fun, vibey way to listen to music. There's no traffic, you know. And and plus, I, uh, I I know what the car stereo sounds like. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always find that music, for some reason, always sounds better on the car stereo. Like when I used to when I used to do recordings, um, you know, whether it be a band or you know, we'd go and we went in the studio one time and did a recording there. It always it was always like, let's go in the car and listen to it. Yeah, oh no, for sure, uh, like. Uh, the the best car stereo I ever had, I called it my reference vehicle. I had a 2003 uh, Volvo S60 with the best sounding stereo I've ever heard in my life. Like there was no hype highs and no hype lows. The mid range was really strong. Like it was great sounding. Like I wish those speakers. I actually looked for those speakers on eBay, like junkyard speakers, to try to put them in a box. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah, the yeah. way they sounded so much. Like, cause I'm like, so I would listen to mixes in the car because I knew what it sounded like. Right. You know, everybody does that. Yeah. yeah. You know, because it's the thing you it's the thing you know more than anything. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I always said when I was mixing a lot of stuff, it's like I wish I could sit in the car and mix. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you yeah, right, exactly. You, you know, like just put the laptop on your lap. Put put yeah, and put it and put yourself in that middle position. In a comfortable seat, yeah. you know, modify the car. <laughs> so you can... <laughs> right, you're just like in the center kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah.
You there? Yeah, I'm back. Hey, there you are. Hi, I'm here. I'm here. We all just went away there for a second. Yeah, yeah. Like I was like, am I still here? <laughs> yeah. Am I, yeah. Still, am I on I? or am I off? It, it went, it it went was, completely it was silent there. Incredibly lonely. Yeah, I felt like I was like, what happened? I was like, it was I was like, still I was like myself in, on the screen. I don't know if I was still in the chat or not. So I, I just felt like I was like in space in a void somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it was so weird. It was like a black hole. Yeah. Are you still, Dave? Are you seeing Tom? No. Yeah, I don't see. I can, I can hear you guys. I just I can't get back to the screen that's got the screen for some reason. I am kind of new at this. Oh. Stuff. I can hear you fine. You can hear me, right? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. It's funny. Someone said Dave spills tequila on the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nope. No, I'm not drinking tonight. So. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I don't know what happened. That's so weird. That's nice. That's adorable. Um, I'll, try, I'll try to figure out how to get back to the screen. I might have to do, rejoin it here in a sec. Well, I think we're – well, go ahead. If you want, go ahead and uh, drop uh, drop off. I don't care. If someone's got some more questions, go for it, you know, whatever. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um, I think we're pretty close to wrapping things up. Dave, did that, you see any? Mark, will that original link still work? Yeah, yeah. If you okay. um, if you want to drop off and come back on with the link, yeah, let me you. do that real quick. Hang on. No problem. Uh, the rap god is destroying the feed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. Uh, yeah, uh, good good car stereo sounds great to listen to your amps through with an iPhone. Yeah, I mean, I I always find like whenever I do a recording, I'm like. I'm gonna go in my car and listen to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, of course. I don't. Know. It just says I, I can hear you guys, but it says I can't join call. So I don't know. Maybe we should wrap it up here. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, cool. Tom. I mean, I can I can jump at, do this again with you guys anytime that I can. You know. Oh, we'd yeah. No, have... we covered a lot. It was great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, love to have you want... back. Yeah, for sure. Like I'm a. Uh, I got to go back to work for a couple of weeks, but like I got the bottom half of October off. Oh, right, well, we'll definitely be in touch. And um, yeah, no, I, this is great. We we covered a lot of stuff, and I, I you know, it was great to have you on. Um, completely different. Cool, no, it's super fun. Yeah, it's like you know, come from all the other guests that we've had, it, it's great to talk from a you know a sound front of house engineer perspective you know it's really cool right. we, have, we have a lot of other stuff we go over to that's a little more guitar centric related mm -hmm. to what i do we were talking pretty globally here for less whatever uh but there's definitely more guitar specific stuff we could we could go over to, to make it more guitar player ish because i am too so um and that's why i try like, to be as advanced as possible with mixing guitar live you know like what you do with guitars yeah, that and just like you know the actual mechanical interface of guitars and why one way is better than another, and uh, don't believe a lot of crap you read. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah, debunking stuff. Well, cool. Well, we'll definitely have you back on. We'll talk cool. about that stuff. Awesome, guys. Well, awesome. Tom. Yeah, Tom. Thank you. Uh, so everybody, check out Tom Abraham. I know if you look up Tom online, uh, if you go on YouTube. You'll see videos of Tom and work he's done and stuff like that. So, um, again, Tom, thank you for your time. Don't blow really. my cover. Don't blow my cover. <laughs> <laughs> he's hiding. He's hiding. I'm in hiding. I'm really, I'm really on the lam. <laughs> <laughs> That's why your video feed went out. Yeah, does anybody, exactly. Does, does anybody use that word anymore, on the lam? <laughs> uh, I think – I, that's why that's why I live in Las Vegas. There's lots of UFOs and my ride is here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's all. Cool, awesome. Dave. Dave, I'll, I'll call you in a couple days about the rig, okay? Okay, great. No problem. All right, guys. Thanks awesome. a lot, man. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Talk nice to, to meet you soon. and thanks Bye. for the link, man. Have a great night. Oh, you're very welcome. Enjoy. All right. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We still have 105 yeah. viewers and um, we will be back. With our next guest is uh, Bad Cat Amps, um, and they are coming on. Uh, when are they coming on? Um, let me see. 
bat bad cat i forget i don't really know i generally find out when people are coming on from your post on facebook <laughs> here we go uh they are coming on nope that's not gonna work um october 1st so oh when are you going away dave October the eleventh. Okay, and then when are you coming back? The twenty twenty eighth or I think twenty eighth. Okay. Just wanted to check for the scheduling of stuff. I think, I think that's correct. And we'll have dates to announce for the store world tour coming. <laughs> the, yeah. the, Fried, the Friedman store tour. <laughs> with Sammy Bowler. With Sammy Bowler and a couple dates with Steve Stevens. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Who's doing the, uh, the music suit? Well, uh, music suit is not happening now. Oh. So now we're doing uh, Sam Ash in New York, I think. Oh, okay. I'll fill you in on the dates. Yeah, let me know. Awesome. All right, well, guys, gals, thanks for watching the show. Have a yeah. great rest of the week, and we'll we'll be hitting this up, uh, hitting you guys up on Facebook and Twitter and all the other places to let you know when our next shows are happening and stuff. But we'll be back October first. All right. Have a great night, Dave. I'll talk to you soon. All Hang righty. On. Yep.